Welcome, everyone. My name is Tang Jin Lee, and on behalf of the Yonsei International Arbitration Association, I would like to welcome all of you to 2021 Yonsei Arbitration Day, or as we call it, YAD. It is our privilege to have you with us today. YAD is the first student-organized annual arbitration conference in Asia, and we are excited to welcome participants from over 21 countries. We aim to provide a platform for eminent scholars, practitioners, and students from across the world to gain insight into the fast-changing issues in the international arbitration community. This year, under the theme of adapting arbitration to changing paradigms, we deal with two topics. First, the green transition, how it affects international arbitration in Asia, and second, tips for students and young practitioners on building their way in international arbitration. Before we begin, we would like to give our sincere thanks to our institutional partner, FIAC, for making this event possible. Thank you also to our supporting organization, KCAB International. We are also pleased to announce that Yonsei Law School will be entering into a memorandum of understanding with FIAC. I will hand the mic to Ms. Michelle Sonen, head of Northeast Asia at SIAC for the MLU signing ceremony. Thank you, Sangjin. Hello, everyone. I am delighted to be your MC for this virtual signing ceremony in which SIC and Yonsei Law School will be entering into a memorandum of understanding. With us are Ms. Lim Sokui, CEO of SIAC, and Dr. Hyung Du Nam, Dean of Yonsei Law School, who will be signing the MOU on behalf of their respective institutions. Ms. Lim and Dean Nam will now each sign a copy of the MOU. Under the MOU, SIAC and Yonsei Law will work together to place students from Yonsei Law in internships at SIAC and to offer a module on SIAC and institutional arbitration as part of the Yonsei Law teaching program. Both parties may also explore conducting joint training programs, seminars, workshops, or other events in Korea. All right, we will now take a quick screenshot photo to commemorate this signing. If I could have Ms. Lim and Dean Nam hold up the MOU. Okay. Okay. So quiz is a bit blurry because of the background. Okay, on three, three, two, one. We'll try one more time. Three, two, one. Okay, I think that we've got it. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we would now like to invite Ms. Lim to deliver brief remarks. Ms. Lim. Dr. Hyung Du Nam, Dean of Yonsei University Law School. Professor Jun Gi Kim, also of Yonsei. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. SIEC is delighted to be entering into this MOU with Yonsei University Law School. Thank you to Dean Nam and our good friend, Jun Gi, for your excellent efforts in coordinating the MOU on the Yonsei side. Yonsei Law is a top law school in Korea, and we greatly look forward to welcoming Yonsei students to SIAC as interns and to bringing the SIAC module to Yonsei through this partnership. SIAC is also honored to be participating in the Yonsei Arbitration Day Conference as the institutional partner Kudos to the students behind this event, the Yonsei International Arbitration Association, for putting together a timely and practical program on climate change and providing guidance to young practitioners and students. Several members of the SIAC family are taking part in today's conference. SIAC board member and vice president of the SIAC Court of Arbitration, Ms. Lucy Reed, 
has recorded a keynote address. Our head, Northeast Asia, Michelle Sonnen, will be speaking on sustainability and arbitration. And we have two young SIC committee members, Daryl Chu, a committee co-chair, and Kushbu Shadaburi speaking, um, well, sharing their tips um, uh, on, um, for young practitioners. We also have to round off the Singapore delegation, um, my good friend, uh, Chao Shan Yu, moderating the first session, and another good friend, uh, Suresh Divanyadin, um, in the second session. So I, although I'm glad that um, we are signing the MOU after a minor delay last year because of COVID, and that we are holding the conference today online, I really do very much wish that we could have done this in person in vibrant Seoul. I've had, I have many fond memories of memorable meals and experiences in Seoul uh, with Jungi and other friends. And uh, I look forward to reconnecting with old friends and to making new friendships with all of you, the next generation of arbitration leaders in Korea. Of course, you are all warmly invited to visit us in Singapore and to tour SIAC's offices once travel resumes. Thank you and have an engaging and productive conference. Thank you, Ms. Lim. Now we would like to invite Dean Nam to also deliver brief remarks. Dean Nam. Madam Im Seok Hui, distinguished guest, good afternoon. Be, 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 and on behalf of Yonsei Law School, it is a great honor for us to in, enter into this memorandum of understanding with the Singapore International Arbitration Center, voted the second most preferred international arbitration center in the world in the most recent Queen Mary survey. We are proud, proud to be the first internet, first university in Korea to enter into an MOU with SIA. <clears throat> Under the MOU, we will work together to place our students in internships at SIA and to offer a module on SIA and in institutional arbitration as part of our teaching program. We will also explore conducting joint training programs, seminars, workshops, and other events with students, scholars, alumni, leading practitioners and arbitrators to promote the development and practice of international arbitration. This collaboration with CEA will further on Yonsei's commitment to providing a world-class legal education and conducting innovative research. We are confident that the CEAC module, internships at CEAC, and other joint programs with CEAC will offer participants a cutting edge institutional perspective of international arbitration. We will look forward to welcoming everyone to Seoul and visiting Singapore in the near future. In the meantime, we wish everyone continued good health and prosperity. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Nam. That concludes our virtual signing ceremony and we thank everyone for their participation. Sangjin, I hand the floor back to you. Thank you, Ms. Michelle. Thank you. We look forward to the much future collaboration between Yonsei Law School and Siak. We are now ready to begin the proceedings of the seminar. I'm happy to start with a keynote address by Ms. Lucy Reed. President of the ICCA and the Vice President of SISAC Court of Arbitration to kick off today's event. She has pre-recorded her keynote address due to the time zone differences. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, it's morning for me. Thank you for the kind invitation through the Singapore International Arbitration Center to deliver the keynote to this conference uh, at Yonsei. As many of you know, I've done a lot of work in and involving Korea, and I wish I could be there with you in person to see old, or I should say, long-standing friends like Professor Young Hee Kim, 
Uh, and me Thank you. We look forward to the much future collaboration between Yonsei Law School and Siak. I actually apologize for not being adaptable enough to do this, uh, to give this keynote on real time. But after some eight years in Asia, I think I've done my share of middle of the night uh, events. I was planning to start my talk with one piece of advice I often give to students and young practitioners, to look ahead and see what new legal skills might be needed rather than to emulate older practitioners, past generations like myself. Um, it appears though that I don't need to share that wisdom with this group because it's already wonderfully reflected in your theme of adapting arbitration to changing paradigms. I congratulate the organizers and the audience for keeping your sights on the future. We are though in the present, still learning to live with the COVID-19 pandemic. And this pandemic has forced many practitioners, whether young or middle-aged or old, to adapt and adopt unfamiliar technologies with record speed. It's been sink or swim actually for many, but technological innovation is not the end. Um, technological innovation doesn't end, I should say, with virtual hearings or Zoom video conferences and electronic documents. Technologies such as artificial intelligence and blockchain have the potential to change our field radically. And it will fall to your generation, not to mine, to ensure that these changes are implemented ethically and responsibly. Now, in addition to the promise and the challenge of new technologies, new areas of practice for international arbitration lawyers, like all lawyers, are emerging constantly. I was lucky, I guess I should say lucky and fortunate, to have my work with the Iran-US Claims Tribunal in the 1980s and early 1990s position me to be a pioneer and a leader in investor state arbitration, ISDS in short. I can well remember when there were only three or four precedents on expropriation or other treaty breaches to cite in a memorial. These were the early Gulf oil expropriation cases. Uh, things, have, things have changed rather a lot. Whether for better or worse is a topic for another day. The point is that it's challenging and exciting to help make new law through arbitration, which requires a lot of adapt adapt adaptability, excuse me, and a dash of courage. Regardless, ISDS is now a well-established practice. I would not say that anyone can do it, but I would say that a lot of people are doing it and there's not unlimited room for others. So where might your generation be pioneers or at least early entrants, attracting new clients and cases and making new law, uh, if you are lucky and fortunate? The list will not surprise you. There likely will be new international disputes relating to cryptocurrency, cybersecurity and terrorism, climate change, the economic impact of pandemics, because trust me, there will be more, and outer space activities, which are rapidly multiplying. This is a genuine new frontier. Maybe, maybe aspects of human rights. Take a look, if you have time, at a Kluwer arbitration blog posted on the 3rd of July of this year, entitled New Opportunities for Arbitration Lawyers, Climate Change, Outer Space, and Human Rights. Now, maybe you will be fortunate enough to practice in several of these areas. If you do have a chance to do something innovative, do not ask yourself, why? Why should I step off a familiar ladder? Ask yourself instead, why not? This is your theme, actually. This is your theme. Go for adaptability. But let me give a point of perspective. It's important to keep in mind that international arbitration is a procedural specialty. Many of us have had truly incredible opportunities to venture into different sectors, different industries, different areas of substantive law, different places, and to meet a fascinating array of people, clients, experts, lawyers, 
uh, and arbitrators. I call international arbitration the last refuge of the generalist. But, and there is a but here, it is a relatively small niche practice that is popular, uh, really in my view, too popular. As I always told my students, even if you're not able to practice international arbitration for a living at the end of the day, the skills that you learn in classes and in moots and in conferences will serve you well in any dispute resolution practice and even in transactional law and in government service. And one more thing I almost forgot, don't forget to watch the swinging pendulum, which is going faster and faster from arbitration to mediation with the Singapore Convention, among other things. Now, as well as new opportunities ahead that require adaptability in international arbitration, there are new challenges. One particular challenge, one that is on the front burner, and in fact, boiling on the front burner for me is broad diversity. Despite really impressive strides in gender diversity in the course of my career, international arbitration suffers from a stubborn lack of diversity in areas of race, ethnicity, uh, and regions, locations. There are good reasons to explain how we got to this situation. I can, I can explain to you how it happened from the beginning of the modern international arbitration practice in around the 1970s, but there are no good reasons not to double down to change the situation. It is correct that the legitimacy of our field is implicated. As a vice president of SEAC and president of ICA, the International Council on Commercial Arbitration, I have made this a personal uh, priority. Trust me, uh, trust me, those of you who are younger, the progress in gender diversity did not happen by accident. Groups such as Arbitral Women, the Equal Representation in Arbitration Pledge, and the Cross-Institutional Task Force on Gender Diversity have worked hard for this progress. We continue to work patiently but persistently to combat outright and unconscious bias against women in arbitration. On that model, we're starting to see newer groups pushing forward on racial diversity, such as REAL, REAL, Racial Equality for Arbitration Lawyers. There should be, uh, and I am confident there will be more such groups. Those of you in Asia, get active if you are not, and if you are, stay active. Keep the long view. Changing gears, another challenge, which is rightfully the focus of your conference, is climate change. Lucy Greenwood, a speaker here, and always a compelling one, is the pioneer in nudging arbitration to get its own house in order with the Green Arbitration Pledge. By the way, if you want to learn more about the power of nudging for change, read Professor Cass Sunstein. Now, I apologize to Lucy Greenwood every time I print something out, which I sometimes do for the old fashioned security of having words on the page when I speak online, like now. Um, but actually, and more truthfully, I tell my listeners not to tell Lucy Greenwood that I am using paper. Now, more seriously and more broadly, all you need to do is follow the news to see that we will face whole new categories of international disputes arising from climate change related disasters, the transition to green technologies, breach of environmental laws, and international climate change obligations. This will come up in various ways, not the least of which is uh, insurance law, uh, and again, perhaps some human rights component. So what can I say except get ready, start adapting now. This brings me to my one last piece of advice, which is applicable to practitioners at all levels of the field. As I often caution, international arbitration is not rocket science. We do not engineer and build rockets. We do not do brain surgery. We do not run refugee camps. We're not elected officials, we don't save lives. Well, actually, 
with the Eritrea Ethiopia Claims Commission, I was fortunate enough or challenged enough to have cases that did involve saving lives. But I will not likely have that opportunity in international humanitarian law again, uh, and neither will you. So please, please avoid the temptation of over glamorizing the practice of international arbitration or the leaders in the field. We're just lawyers like so many others in a service industry. A learned uh, professional service industry, but a service industry nonetheless. International arbitration tribunals and the arbitration community cannot compel governments to change policy or market actors to act in a particular way, for example, by reducing carbon emissions or stopping deforestation. What we can do and are trained to do and have chosen to do is to resolve disputes efficiently and most importantly, fairly and with due process of law so that others can get on with their businesses and their lives. And that is not unimportant. Thank you for listening. I wish you a very successful arbitration day ahead. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thank you, Ms. Reed, for your wise words. It's currently 12.23, and we will start our first, first session at 2.30 KS KST Sharp. So please stay tuned, and we will see you in seven minutes. Thank you. Hello. Thank you for returning. Before we jump into our session, I would like to quickly note that there is a Q&A button on your screens. Attendees who have any questions can freely enter them in, and our moderators would be happy to take them into consideration during the panel discussion. Now, we begin our first session, the green transition, how it affects international arbitration in Asia. Mr. Chu Shan Yu will be the moderator of this session. Shan Yu is currently the head of the litigation and dispute resolution group at Wong Partnership in Singapore. He is on the panel of arbitrators for numerous arbitration centers, including SIAC, AIAC, KCAB, and more. I now pass the mic to Mr. Chu Shan. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Sangjin. Um, I'm extremely delighted to be able to moderate the first session uh, today. Um, there are, in fact, two main topics in respect of the main team uh, in this session. The first two speakers uh, will share on the important role and part that needs to be played by all stakeholders in the international arbitration community to tackle and reduce uh, the environmental impact of international arbitration practice. The first speaker will be Ms. Lucy Greenwood, uh, an independent international arbitrator specializing in commercial and investment disputes. Uh, Lucy has practiced international arbitration for over 23 years and has acted as arbitrator in over 60 arbitrations since becoming a full-time arbitrator in 2017. She has particular experience in energy-related disputes. Significantly, uh, with respect to this afternoon's session, Lucy is the founder of the Campaign for Greener Arbitrations, an extremely important initiative to reduce the environmental impact of international arbitration. Lucy will speak uh, on climate change and the practice of arbitration, uh, focusing on the climate crisis, and I believe will provide uh, a valuable first-hand insight uh, into the work of the Campaign for Greener Arbitrations. Following Lucy will be Ms. Michelle Sonnen Park. Michelle is the head Northeast Asia of the SIAC. Uh, in this capacity, uh, Michelle oversees SIAC's activities in South Korea and Japan. Prior to joining SIAC, uh, Michelle worked uh, with the International Arbitration Practice Group of a leading Korean law firm where she had represented clients in international arbitration matters arising out of a broad range of commercial disputes. 
Uh, Michelle is qualified as an attorney in the US, uh, and she previously served as a law clerk to a federal appeals court judge and a federal district court judge in the US. Michelle will speak about the role of arbitral institutions in enhancing sustainability, focusing on the role of arbitral institutions in reducing the carbon footprint of arbitration and adopting green procedures, and also addressing potential due process concerns. The next main topic to be covered this afternoon would be on climate change related disputes. Um, and as you've heard uh, from Ms. Lucy Reid earlier, uh, you know, this will be an increasing uh, area of work for many of us. Uh, first up uh, on this main topic will be Ms. Jitanjari Bajaj, who will speak about resolving climate change related disputes through international commercial arbitration, focusing on climate change disputes uh, in that uh, sphere. Uh, Jitanjali is a partner at DLA Piper Australia, and she co-heads DLA Piper's International Arbitration Practice in Asia Pacific. Jitanjali specializes in international commercial arbitration, and with a sector focus on oil and gas, construction and infrastructure and renewables. Uh, Jitanjali has been widely launched for her expertise in international arbitration. Uh, she was in fact named 2022 Lawyer of the Year International Arbitration, Sydney, uh, by the best lawyers and arbitration practitioner of the year 2020 in the Australian ADR Awards. She's also a vice president of Akika. Uh, last but not least uh, is Mr. Wu Jae Kim, who will speak about environmental claims in investment treaty arbitration, focusing on those claims in that sphere. Wu Jae is a partner in Bay Kim and Lee in Seoul, where he focuses on international arbitration and international litigation uh, with an emphasis, I believe, in large-scale construction matters, general corporate matters, post-MNA, and energy issues. Uh, Wujie completed his training at the Judicial Research uh, and Training Institute in 2009 and then worked as a judge advocate for three years uh, and later on as an attorney at Lee & Co. before joining BKL in 2013. Uh, he has represented clients in various investor state disputes, uh, including uh, debt filed by loan star funds against the Korean government. Uh, there will be opportunities, uh, as Sangjit had mentioned, for questions to be raised. Uh, please use the Q&A function. Uh, the questions will be posed uh, to the speakers after uh, the presentations have been concluded. Uh, so without further ado, I, it, it gives me great pleasure to invite Lucy uh, to speak first. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you very much. And thank you to everyone for inviting me to be part of this wonderful uh, session today. I'm, I'm very excited by it. I thoroughly enjoyed uh, Lucy Reed's wonderful keynote and uh, looking forward to a great debate a bit later on. I'm absolutely delighted to kick us off today um, to talk for about 10 minutes or so on climate change and international arbitration. But I warn you, I am going to be focusing on the practical aspects of it. So I want everyone to be not just taking notes, but I want everyone to be taking action because we all have to change. And Lucy has encouraged you already to uh, be courageous and be pioneers. And this is where those of you who are at the start of your careers in international arbitration can really underscore the new practices that we need to uh, adopt and to ensure that we continue to adopt them as we, as we go forward into the future. It's a slightly hackneyed image, but one that I always find quite arresting is, is the image that if the time of the universe, since the universe began, is compressed into one 24 hour period, humans only appear in the last four seconds, which always makes me feel very insignificant, frankly. Um, and, and it partly chimes with what Lucy was saying in her keynote about, you know, we, we shouldn't over glamorize or overstate our, our value in the world, but also we shouldn't understate the impact that individuals can have. So in those last four seconds, in the last milliseconds of those four seconds, 
human activity has changed the climate on the planet. There is no getting around that. We are now in a climate emergency and we, we only have to look at the, um, the weather events that we're seeing with increasing frequency and, our, and, it, and they're terrifying. I speak from experience of this having lived in Houston when Hurricane Harvey hit. Yet, even though we've been living with the knowledge of the impending, and I would say now upon us climate emergency for many years, in, in the international arbitration community, we really have been very slow to wake up to this issue. And that's why it's so incredibly rewarding to see sessions like this focusing on the green transition and actually shining a spotlight on these issues. Um, and really finally being given, frankly, the attention they deserve. Now, as Greta Thunberg says, she makes it sound so easy. We all, in order to address climate change, we all just have to wake up and change. Well, <laughs> we know it's not that easy. But for me, I woke up in 20, back in 2018 when I was chairing a major energy arbitration in Houston. And it was a two week hearing. You all know the drill. It was you know, a very large conference room in a hotel. And I, at the end of the two week hearing, I looked behind me and there was this wall of printed materials and uh, not one of those binders had been opened during the two-week hearing. And that was because I, as chair of the tribunal I had insisted that we had electronic copies and everything was done on screen but I'd agreed with my co-arbitrators who were a bit more reluctant than I was that we would have hard copy bundles in case the technology failed. And at the end of that two-week hearing I, went, I flew back to England, my co-arbitrators uh, flew back to parts of the US and we just said to the council, I'll just shred the document. And that, that has been replicated, I would suspect, across the world in international arbitration. And I realized at that point that that was not good enough. So I looked at the available technology and, and, I, and I said to myself, why? Why are we running arbitrations in such an old fashioned way? The arbitration I'd just completed in 2018 really looked very, very similar to my first ever arbitration in 1998. I would say the only difference was that, uh, as we all know, the pleadings have got longer. Um, so that was the point when I started to say, look, we, we need to think more critically about how we run our cases. The technology was there. It was there to help us run arbitrations more efficiently, more cost effectively. It was also there to help us reduce our carbon footprint. And as far as I could tell, we weren't, we weren't using it for any of those purposes. At that point, I, I committed to uh, what I called my green pledge, which was a pledge that I would try and encourage council appearing before me uh, to run the matter in a more environmentally friendly way. Soon I realized that that worked for arbitrators like me, but actually the whole community and the whole, really the whole global community in arbitration needed a broader campaign that we could get behind. And that's when um, we launched the campaign for greener arbitration. And I will talk briefly about the campaign um, in, in due course, but I, I, I do want to flag what we've done very recently, and that is to establish these wonderful regional subcommittees. And we, we have an Asia PAC regional subcommittee that is uh, launching imminently and I do encourage those of you who are interested please do to go to our website and um, you know, signal if you if you want to get involved with, with in particular with the Asia PAC um, regional subcommittee we we need all the help we can get so please if that's something that interests you do reach out to me or to any member of the global steering committee. Before I get into the work of the campaign I do want to tell you that international arbitration does have a significant carbon footprint. I think for years we kind of didn't face up to this because as lawyers, we can often end up you know, pointing to the clients that we represent and saying, well, we just do what, you know, we represent our client in the best way we can. And it's really not up to us to um, have great input into the process. It's, it's not our problem, basically. But frankly, it is our problem. The campaign conducted research into one major international arbitration uh, about two, two and a half years ago now. And we concluded that in order to offset 
the carbon emissions of that one major international arbitration, you would have to plant 20,000 trees, which I will tell you is the whole of the number of trees roughly in Central Park. So pretty significant. Now, of course, there are going to be arbitrary. That was a big major international arbitration and there will be uh, domestic arbitrations, perhaps with smaller carbon footprint, there will be online arbitrations with a smaller carbon footprint, but the point remains the same. Each of them will have a carbon footprint, and frankly, we all have to act to reduce uh, that footprint. So I would very much like to see us build on the new practices that, as Lucy said, we've been forced to adopt as a result of the pandemic. And I want us to take stock as we hope we move out of the pandemic uh, and into that famous phrase, the new normal, um, that we don't slip back into those old ways. And we actually start to look at our practices with a, not just a lens of acting in, our, in the best interests of our clients, which is obviously overriding. I want to see us layer in len a lens of considering diversity. I want to see us layer in a lens of considering the environment. We need as arbitration practitioners to take a much more holistic approach to our practices. Let me talk about the changes we can make. We can make big changes and we can make small changes. Big changes are obviously questioning the need to fly at every stage of our arbitration. Yes, we know we've all been at home for the last 18 months, but I'm, I'm looking at, as I say, looking at the future and I don't want to see us back, going back to the old, we'll just leap on a plane at the drop, drop of a hat because, oh boy, we arbitration practitioners, we love to travel. And frankly, the, I, in my view, those days are over. You know, a couple of long haul flights can double an individual carbon, foot, carbon footprint for the year. So that's big changes. Small changes. Well, when we looked at the uh, carbon footprint of this major international arbitration, we looked at the obvious contenders. We looked at printing, we looked at couriers, we looked at flights, we looked at hotels. We also looked at coffee cups. And I will tell you that uh, our research found that at the end of this major international arbitration, we estimated, and it was a pretty robust estimate, that around three and a half thousand disposable coffee cups were used during the course of that arbitration, which, which um, really requires two conclusions. One, that arbitration practitioners drink a lot of coffee. And the second is that we have to ditch the disposable cup and get rid of single-use plastic as far as we can. The overarching campaign, uh, sorry, the overarching message of the campaign is pretty simple. It is fly less and print less. And I've touched on, on flying less. It's really, as I say, a matter of questioning whether the flight is really necessary. If it is, then there are things you can do to, um, to reduce the carbon footprint of that flight. Um, and at, as a very last resort, there's obviously carbon offsetting. In terms of printing, this is an, an interesting one. E-bundles are increasingly used, and I would just like to say on the record I, right now, I forgive Lucy Reed officially for any printing she may do. Um, but uh, we don't say don't print things, we just say don't blanket print things. So you, if you need to print a certain document, then print that document again. It's, it's approaching your practice with a critical eye. That, that is what we are asking you to do help you there is help out there um, to help you make these changes we have launched the what we call, what we've called the green protocols and they're they're on our website and they are we hope easy to use guidance for every practitioner in sorry, each, each each element of the an arbitration um, is represented in the protocol so we have protocols for arbitral proceedings, we have protocols from law firms, arbitrators, institutions, hearing venues, and conference organizers. And when we launched these protocols, we, we 
I had a very detailed feedback um, period and we were concerned that we might have made them too prescriptive. But our feedback was very much that people wanted to know what they could do. So when you look at the protocols, don't be daunted by the fact that they are quite detailed, but, but review them and pick and choose what, what works for you. But do something, because as I come back to my key point is that we all have to make these changes. The protocols really talk about all sorts of things. They talk about best practices in setting up workspaces, managing your work environment. They talk about best practices in terms of electronic communications, because people may not be aware that electronic communications have sometimes a quite a heavy carbon footprint as well. The protocols talk about travel. I, I mentioned briefly carbon offsetting. Um, and they also talk about how to dispose of physical and electronic waste um, in an environmentally friendly way whilst maintaining confidentiality obligations. So please, they are on our website at greenerarbitrations.com and um, I, I really commend them to you if, which I hope you will be convinced if to uh, make some of these changes. So help is very much out there. I'm going to stop there and turn it over to Michelle, who is going to look as um, in detail about the roles that institutions can play um, and have played, frankly, so far. Um, institutions have played a key role in not only disseminating this message, but updating rules and uh, really driving through best practices in this, in this area. So thank you and let me hand over to Michelle. Thanks very much, Lucy. Michelle? Okay. Thank you, Sean. Um, thank you, Lucy. Um, you, you've given us so much to think about. And the reality is that climate change is a tremendous threat to our collective society and the impact of our lives, the environmental impact our lives and, and our profession is not something that we can ignore any longer. Um, I really admire your work, Lucy, um, and the others behind the Campaign for Greener Arbitration. Um, it's, it's really an important step to enhancing sustainability and reducing our carbon footprint. Um, as Lucy Reed noted in her keynote, and how lucky are we to have two Lucys speaking today, uh, we have made great strides in improving gender diversity thanks to the Equal Representation Pledge, Arbitral Women, and other initiatives. Um, those of us in Asia, where the climate effects of climate change are especially severe, I think have a special responsibility. Um, a recent McKinsey study found that by 2050, parts of Asia may see lethal heat waves, ex extreme precipitation, severe hurricanes, drought, changes in water supply, among others. And it will be the poorer countries that unfortunately are most at risk. Um, now, we're just humble international arbitration lawyers. To quote Lucy Reed, Lucy Reed again, we do not save lives and we cannot compel government policy, uh, but we can do our part. And I would like to talk today about the role institutions like SIC can play in enhancing the sustainability of our practice. Um, I also would like to preface this by saying these are my personal views and not necessarily the views that I see. <laughs> so arbitral institutions are an integral part of arbitration today. The global business community has overwhelmingly selected international arbitration as the preferred mechanism to resolve cross-border disputes. And the clear preference is for institutional arbitration over ad hoc. The rising popularity of institutional arbitration has brought about a change in perception. There is an expectation that institutions will develop best practices, propose new reforms, push policy initiatives, and regulate the proceedings and the players. Through issuing rules, supervising cases, and acting as thought leaders, institutions today are uniquely placed to influence the future of international arbitration. At SIC, we have a history and a culture of innovation that has contributed to the evolution of our practice. Uh, we have on several occasions led uh, in adapting our rules to keep pace with the changing needs of the international business community. For example, we were an early mover on emergency arbitration, expedited procedure, early dismissal, ARMAD-ARB, to name a few. 
Also our events and conferences, like our flagship event, the SIC Congress, have explored topics on the cutting edge um, of the law and practice of international arbitration. Our capacity building and training programs like the SIAC Academy nurture future, future generations of industry leaders. The response to COVID-19 is a good example of the leadership role played by institutions. When countries began imposing lockdowns and closing their borders, arbitration stakeholders looked to institutions for guidance as to whether dispute resolution could proceed and what it would look like. SIC and other institutions responded quickly with creativity, adaptability to ensure that arbitration could in fact proceed. And we all know what happened next. Almost overnight, everything moved online, including substantive hearings. And we're still here, still using Zoom a year and a half later. Although we dearly miss seeing each other face to face, giving hugs, shaking hands, sharing meals, one silver lining, in my view, um, to the pandemic has been that it should really showed us how adaptable the arbitration community can be. And when faced with an emergency, we did rise to the challenge. Um, as Lucy mentioned just a few minutes ago, our response to COVID um, could be a starting point for a really broad response to climate change. Arbitration has already gotten significantly greener thanks to travel restrictions taking a long haul flight to participate in a one hour case management conference now seems absurd. Printing thousands of pages and hearing bundles and shipping them over an ocean for a three day hearing, which I personally have participated in, um, that just seems archaic. I think also reading the tea leaves, parties will also start to demand better from us. ESG is a buzzword in the corporate and legal world as investors increasingly expect sustainable practices from companies. As corporations work to reduce their own carbon footprints, they may require that same kind of commitment from their dispute resolution providers. So what can institutions do to help lead this green transition? For one, institutions play a significant role and can play a significant role in bringing this issue to the forefront through thought leadership. When we set agendas for conferences, webinars, workshops, task forces, and so on. Institutions help shape wider conversations about what is important and what demands attention from the community. It is through thought leadership initiatives, events, reports, et cetera, that issues previously thought academic or esoteric or even eccentric become mainstream. Ideas get fleshed out and refined, transformed into concrete proposals and start to gain traction. This conference is an excellent example. We are gathered here virtually discussing the impact of climate change on arbitration. We surely weren't the first conference to take this on and hopefully we won't be the last. The dialogue will continue to spread and with any luck, green procedures will become so mainstream that failing to adopt them will be the eccentric idea. Also the fact that the topic for this session, the green transition was selected by students underscores its importance and the urgency felt by young people today. Another area where institutions can lead is by encouraging and as Lucy Reed said earlier, nudging parties and tribunals to adopt greener procedures and helping to facilitate those choices through our rules and offerings. So an obvious place to start and where significant progress has already been made is for institutions to remove obstacles in their rules that might hinder the adoption of reasonable green procedures. Take virtual hearings, for example. The SIAC rules do not require in-person hearings and recent revisions to the ICC rules, the LCA rules likewise now allow for virtual hearings. Um, as we have seen, many parties have been able to in fact forego in-person hearings and the extensive travel that comes with them. Some tribunals have even been willing to mandate virtual hearings over party objections. And the general consensus seems to be that this does not deprive parties of due process given the extreme circumstances of COVID. Looking forward, we may see tribunals likewise mandate virtual hearings in certain cases where the environmental impact of an in-person hearing is just unjustifiable. Or we may see institutional rules include card and offsets as part of the cost of the arbitration. Another example is with regard to hard copies of submissions. Um, the trend across major institutions is to phase out hard copies and move to an e-filing system. 
Institutions can also help parties identify arbitrators that are committed to running green institutions and uh, green arbitration. As part of a website revamp, SIC hopes to make its panel of arbitrators searchable. And as an example, we could include a search filter for where the arbitrator for to search for arbitrators that have taken the green pledge. Parties that are committed to green procedures could use this tool to nominate arbitrators that will run the arbitration in such a way as to reduce the environmental impact. And by publicly identifying green friendly arbitrators, it might encourage others to change their behavior as well. Institutions can also lead through guidance notes and other resources that make it easier for parties to adopt green procedures. I find that people often want to live more sustainably, myself included, but we don't always know how. We don't know what the steps are um, that we could take. In the arbitration context, if we can identify concrete actions that parties could easily adopt, um, many parties and tribunals I think would be likely to adopt them. And in this regard, I think the green protocols and the model procedure put together by Lucy and the campaign for green arbitration are really fantastic. They do the heavy lifting of coming up with concrete actions and they're all tailored for all of different um, arbitrations, different stakeholders. Institutions I think can also contribute here, much like we've done with virtual hearings. Last year, we released, SIC released a guide called Taking Your Arbitration Remote. And it helps users navigate remote hearings through checklists that help parties identify and, and address the many issues that arise when moving to a virtual format, such as the choice of platform, dealing with multiple time zones and Zoom fatigue, data security, and so on. A, green, a guidance note on green procedures might address travel, remote hearing, carbon offsetting, data security, cloud storage, for example, and, and a number of other issues. Institutions will also play a role in resolving disputes, arise, disputes arising out of climate change. And I know my colleagues will be discussing this shortly, um, but we can anticipate, for example, commercial disputes arising out of the construction of infrastructure for renewable energy or losses stemming from natural disasters. We might see investor state claims against states for regulations arising out of climate change policy reforms and so forth. Parties will seek out arbitrators with expertise in climate change disputes. And when called on to make an appointment, SIC and institutions can draw on expertise um, to ensure that the arbitrators appointed have the right expertise in scientific fields, technical um, climate change disputes and so on. Institution, institutions, of course, cannot control the parties or the tribunal or tribunals. As we know, a cornerstone of international arbitration is party autonomy, but institutions can help lead the way. And I look forward to more conversations like this one about what steps we can take. I think my time is up, so I will end here um, and hand the floor back to Sean. Thank, thank you very much uh, for sharing that, uh, Michelle. Um, can I just encourage everyone to send in your questions? Um, we haven't received any so far, <laughs> uh, you know, and uh, I, I, you know, we'd be more than happy to put your questions to uh, the speakers. So can I now invite uh, Jitanjali to uh, speak on your topic? Thank you, thank you, Sean. And um, thank you for having me here, everyone. I'm quite delighted to be here and to be speaking amongst uh, such an esteemed group of panelists. Um, so uh, in this part of the session, I'm going to move more into some of the substantive consideration of climate change related disputes. And specifically, I'm going to discuss the role of international commercial arbitration in resolving such disputes. So I'm going to first start by looking at what are the type of climate change related disputes that will face us in the coming decade. And then it, whether international commercial arbitration as a dispute resolution mechanism is suitable and effective both procedurally and substantively to resolve such disputes. Now, much of what I'm going to cover today is derived from the report on resolving climate change related disputes through arbitration and ADR, which is published by the ICC Task Force on Arbitration of Climate Change Related Disputes in 2019. And also, of course, from uh, Lucy's writings, who you have heard from before and who, as you all know, is leading the charge for the arbitration community screen transition. In fact, if you are interested in this topic, I would highly recommend following and reading Lucy's blog on her website. Um, so moving then to the new types of climate change related disputes. Now, climate change related disputes can be broken down into two subcategories. 
Uh, there would be those relating pro to proactively managing the prospect of climate change, and then of course, those related to the consequences of climate change. Now, the latter category relating to consequences of climate change, we've been seeing those disputes for some time, but we can expect growth in both especially given the increasing regulation across the globe and especially following the entry into force of the Paris Agreement. Um, the ICC task report that I mentioned before, it sets out three categories of contracts, which it says may result in climate change related commercial disputes, thereby inviting the consideration whether international commercial arbitration would be the right dispute resolution mechanism for such disputes. Now, these three categories are First is disputes concerning contracts, which are concluded with a view to implementing the transition, adaptation, or mitigation commitments in the Paris Agreement. So such contracts will give rise to direct disputes. An example of this could be a dispute between an owner and a contractor in relation to the construction of a solar panel field, which has been built with the specific aim of achieving, say, certain emission reduction targets under the Paris Agreement. The second category is disputes concerning contracts that are not specifically related to transition adaptation and mitigation, but nonetheless impacted by climate change. So such commercial disputes are likely to arise in the range of sectors that we know to be commonly impacted by climate change, like energy, agriculture, or infrastructure. And these contracts may give rise to indirect disputes. Uh, then lastly, the ICC task force considered disputes that can be referred to arbitration pursuant to submission agreements. So here the task force considered that it, it is possible that where there is a climate change related dispute and there's no arbitration agreement, parties would actually decide to submit those to arbitration if they believed that arbitration would be more suitable to deal with such a dispute rather than a domestic court. Uh, so that very well segues into, well, is international commercial arbitration suitable and effective for climate related change, uh, climate change related disputes rather than litigation? Uh, so first looking at procedural suitability. Now procedural suitability of international commercial arbitration for such disputes essentially includes all of the advantages we generally list when we compare arbitration to litigation. The first of this is something that Michelle actually just mentioned, the fact that international commercial arbitration has the distinct advantage of allowing parties to appoint arbitrators with the right expertise which is necessary for their dispute. So you could appoint the right arbitrator with the right regulatory background in climate change regulations or the right scientific, technical, along with the legal background if that is needed. International commercial arbitration then further allows the parties and the tribunals to have recourse to relevant scientific and technical expertise by appointment of experts. So whether they be party appointed experts or tribunal appointed experts. Then of course, the great inherent flexibility of the process. Now this can be very well suited to say address urgency, which is often critical for the meaningful resolution of a climate change related dispute. So in this context under institutional rules under almost all, actually all institutional rules, tribunals are free to adopt procedure as it suits. So you could facilitate a fast resolution by adopting procedures, whether such as bifurcation or resolution of certain issues on papers or certain, certain technical matters by, you know, by uh, conclaves of the technical experts. Then most arbitral institutions also offer things like expedited rules, which parties could have adopted at the time of when they are drafting the dispute resolution clause. And then there's of course, emergency arbitration or recourse to urgent interim and conservatory measures. Now, the final advantage is of course, the near worldwide and seamless coverage for enforcement courtesy of the New York convention. Now, ease of enforcement, I think, of an arbitral award under the New York Convention as compared to a national court's judgment is perhaps the most critical factor in supporting the suitability of international commercial arbitration for such disputes. Um, all of that said, there are also several procedural issues that are likely to impact the efficacy of international commercial arbitration as a suitable forum. And if we, are, if we do want this to be a forum of first choice, these matters will need to be addressed by the arbitration community, particularly arbitral institutions. So, you know, just a few more things to add to Michelle's list. Um, first of these would be that one of the main reasons parties choose international commercial arbitration is because of its private nature. On the other hand, if you look at climate change related disputes, these are matters of public interest. And so the lack of transparency in international commercial arbitration can be viewed as a barrier to its legitimacy. 
you know, even something like decisional trends, you want decisional trends to be in climate change disputes, and they would be hard to predict if you don't have access to the decisions uh, in relation to the, such disputes. Um, then secondly, environmental issues are very prone to intervention by third parties, typically to raise public interest questions. We commonly see this in amicus curiae in, in, in interventions in investment arbitrations. So we would also need to consider how this would work in the context of private dispute resolution method. In the ICC task force report, they talk about the ICC rules on joinder and also just on the inherent ability for a tribunal to allow for submissions by third party. But I do think that this is an area and a lot more work would need to be done rather than just uh, rely on rules that are not squarely meant for a process such as this. Um, and then thirdly, more often than not, climate change disputes may relate to situations that are not yet crystallized. They can be ongoing. So in that regard, if you're just going to have a one-off arbitration, a one-off arbitral tribunal and one-off award, that's just not going to work um, in such a dispute because it's likely to be that you actually need a standing body of adjudicators that can monitor the dispute, you know, for example, a polluted site over a period of time. Um, an example of this, which everyone's familiar from construction contracts is basically dispute boards. Um, then looking then at the substantive suitability of, um, of international commercial arbitration, there's not that much criticism raised on this. And I think one of the most interesting points that I came across was actually, I think, from one of your writings, Lucy, which revolved around the question of the word commercial. That is, depending upon the subject matter of the climate change related dispute, if the dispute ca can be mainly characterized as a public interest dispute, can it also be classified as commercial? And if not, what impact is that going to have when you go for enforcement under the New York Convention, given the large number of signatories to the New York Convention who have a commercial reservation. But overall, from what, what you can see I've said and what can be seen from the ICC task force, task force report, overall the benefits of international commercial arbitration is a dispute resolution mechanism far outweigh the drawbacks. And the drawbacks that we see in the process are all any in any event such drawbacks that can be dealt with some procedural innovation. Uh, this procedural innovation, how will it come about? more of us talking about it, the arbitration community, and of course, the arbitral institutions taking some action in order to see how they can amend or improve upon their rules and offer and provide for the appropriate procedures. Um, so we heard from Michelle when she said about, you know, appointing arbitrators with specific expertise. So if I was to think of a list of things institutions could consider at this point, so as to make the uh, use of international commercial arbitration commonplace for climate change related disputes, it would be actually considering having a specialized list of arbitrators who have the relevant environmental, scientific, regulatory and technical expertise to deal with such disputes. You could have specific rules or orders that the parties could adopt uh, or the tribunal could adopt, uh, the tribunal could uh, issue with respect to transparency on a case by case basis. So if it is a case of public interest, what, what is the amount or extent of transparency that can be allowed? Um, you could have dispute board rules. So like they, some of you might know, the ICC actually has dispute board rules in order to appoint dispute boards, uh, which the parties can then adopt in their suite of contracts. So you could have, if parties know that this is going to be, uh, the issues arising from a contract are going to be climate change related disputes which will require monitoring over a long period of time uh, if there are dispute boards that can be appointed at the start from the start to the finish that is something that can also be provided by institutions then consideration about whether rules can accommodate am amicus curiae submissions now i know that there 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 is talk about inherent flexibility, rules of joinder, et cetera, but all which come with agreement. Um, but I think this is an area where thought could be given to it before it actually happens. It will avoid the situation we had when I think about a year and a half ago, everybody was just trying to consider whether you could have a virtual hearing or not if the word of a certain translation says in person and the institutions then had to provide clarification. So it's, uh, you, you might as well, um, hit this issue head on. 
Um, then, of course, there is the consideration that you could actually provide for a separate set of rules for environmental and climate change related disputes. Now, it's not to say some don't have it. So, for example, the PCA has optional rules for arbitration of disputes relating to natural resources and or environment. Now, admitted, admittedly, these are all rules. They were intended to deal with environmental disputes in the traditional sense and not in the climate related context. But even then, they provide some very useful provisions that can enhance PCA's ability to administer a climate change related dispute as compared to other rules. Um, so that is something uh, also that thinking forward institutions could consider. Um, so these are just a few more things to add to the list of the arbitration community to consider and think of uh, in terms of actually preparing ourselves uh, to meet with the growing climate change related disputes that we are going to see in the future. Um, thank you for this opportunity and I can um, ha hand over to Mr. Kim now to discuss investment arbitration and environmental disputes. Thank, thanks very much, Dr. Uh, and thanks for touching on some of the innovations which I think uh, you know, would need to be addressed and, and considered. And if we have some time later on, uh, perhaps we could come back to this topic and I would also i uh, like to open up the floor to uh, the other panelists uh, if they have any uh, views on some of these innovations. Um, perhaps we can now move on to Vijay. Last but not least, um, uh, could you, uh, and I think you have some PowerPoint slides. Oh yeah, I do, yeah. Okay, um, so thank you um, for this uh, opportunity. I'm honored to be among these esteemed uh, speakers, lecturers, practitioners, and uh, be and today be speaking to you about um, um, how environmental claims uh, are impacting the investment treaty uh, arbitration scene. Um, and I, I don't think I have to repeat uh, what was uh, discussed by by my colleagues in the three um, in the three previous. Um, um, presentations. Uh, the environment is uh, becoming a significant factor, not in not only in the course of our practice, but in our day, everyday lives. And it's interesting to see how that issue, the issue of environment, is also becoming more of uh, a factor in, in the cases that that we encounter. Uh, in, uh, not only in the context of um, I guess ICC or CAC arbitrations, but also in investment uh, treaty arbitrations. So just like to give a short uh, presentation on that topic. So next slide, please. So I think uh, my presentation would be consisted of uh, three main points is uh, just a brief um, explanation on the recent trends and, um, um, and, and how exactly uh, does like env uh, environmental claims or environmental issues take form in investment treaty um, arbitrations. Um, my understanding is that it's usually the case that, that states enforcing uh, environmental law against investors by way of counterclaims in investment treaty arbitrations. Um, the second form is more traditional as in the investors enforcing environmental obligations against the states. So after going over the recent trends, I'd just like to touch upon uh, these two um, forms of investment, inv environmental claims and investment treaty um, arbitrations. Um, next slide, please. Slide. So um, just to repeat uh, what was discussed, um, the environmental issues are becoming the source and the emerging element of investment treaty um, disputes. Um, there's a recent survey that I came across which says that uh, to, since 2012, um, there have been more than 60, um, as of 2009, there have been more than 60 investment treaty arbitrations that filed that have significant environmental components. Um, and in the course of our practice, uh, we, we, I, I personally, we come across a lot of cases which involves em environmental regulations concerning renewable energy proje projects. And as, as I think was mentioned by Michelle like in her presentation, that may, many cases that concern uh, environmental regulations imposed by the government uh, on renewable um, energy projects, solar and wind projects, and how that, that, uh, how that contravenes uh, the, the interest of the investors. That's often the topic that we come across. And also 
um, you come across a lot of cases where the envir environmental issues uh, sort of change how we deal with more traditional forms of, of arbitration, not only in the context of investment treaty arbitration, but also in, in, in ICC or SEAC arbitrations, as in um, it becomes more of a significant factor in, in construction arbitration and infrastructure related disputes. And that is a growing trend um, that we see and I see on, on a very frequent basis. So with, with these recent trends as a background, what, what, how, how do invest, in, environmental issues take form in investment treaty arbitration? Uh, next slide, please. So, 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 the, so, so the first um, form that, that invest, environmental claims take form is states enforcing environmental claims against investors. Now, um, this may come across as, as not as common as most investment treaty arbitrations, where it's actually mostly the, uh, the investors um, um, initiating or, or claiming claims against the, the government, the, the states. But environmental law, environmental issues, in, in many cases, have become the subject of counterclaims by the states against investors against in investment treaty arbitrations initiated filed by the investor. Um, next slide, please. Now, um, so so um, there are several bases which uh, this may be possible, and I'd just like to move to the next slide. So how how, how, how so so I guess the first threshold question is. How can states um, file or, or me, file counterclaims against um, investors in investment treaty arbitrations um, owing to environmental issues? Um, there are three broad categories or three broad ways that this can be done. And um, first, um, if it's agreed, uh, if it's something that's in, in the agreed arbitration rules, then um, it can be a pathway for counterclaims by the states. Um, the second, uh, I think, more uh, conventional way is that the parties consent, and the part and, and the tribunal makes that kind of a ruling or interpretation on 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 a similar counterclaim. And uh, I stated a case here is in Burlington Resources versus Ecuador, where Ecuador, the state of Ecuador, um, advanced the counterclaim alleging a breach of Ecuadorian environmental law, approximately 2.2.8 billion dollars, and Burlington agreed not to contest. Um, jurisdiction over counterclaims by separate agreements. So this is one of the ways that that, that states um, proceed in press advancing um, counterclaims against the investors. Um, the third way, the third pathway, may be um, dispute resolution clauses in the BIT, and 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 in cases where that permits counterclaims to be brought by the state. Um, this may be more conventional, I, I would think, and. and cases uh, in Ubisar versus Argentina in the Nixit case, um, this was the interpretation by the tribunal, where, wherein the tribunal said that um, Argentina, uh, under the BIT, the BIT uh, had the right to advance a counterclaim against Ubisar, the investor, uh, in the investment treaty arbitration that Ubisar had initiated against um, Argentina. So these are the three pathways where environmental counterclaims are are advanced in investment treaty arbitrations. Next slide, please. So if, if that sort of deals with the pathway or IE jurisdiction, uh, what's the source of, of, of the obligations or, or how we call it the breach? Like where's the source of the breach? And, um, and, and that's the more critical question, that's more substantive question. And it, it, the, the, the first, I guess, uh, the, the first, um, um, category that you see is domestic laws of the host state governing environmental protection. This is, I guess, the more conventional where, where the source of the breach or the source of the obligation comes in. And the Burlington case in the Burlington Resources versus Ecuador case, uh, the exit tribunal, it's a very long, uh, I think a lot of you are, are well aware of, 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 this, uh, of, of, this, uh, of this award, but the exit tribunal awarded uh, 29 million, more than $29 million to Ecuador for environmental harm caused by the investor in the breach of Ecuadorian statutory environmental regulation regime. So um, this is one of the leading cases where the tribunal in the Nixit case um, found that because the investor had breached 
um, the, the, the local laws concerning environment, the state was owed um, a significant amount for the recovery of its damages. Next slide, please. But there are other ways. Um, uh, um, and, and I think the, the third, I guess, uh, category would be applicable international law. And um, just circling back to the Ubisar case versus Argentina, uh, as you can see in the slides, um, there, there, there was a claim or there was an argument that was presented by Argentina saying that in the absence, even in the absence of local law or Argentina law concerning the environmental issues that was disputed, um, the investor um, could in principle be bound by um, in the international human rights obligations concerning the right to water or to sewage. And in the, in the tribunal in this case um, agreed in principle that that could be possible, but, um, but, but as you can see in the slides here, the, the tribunal was unable to find any specific international law, human rights or environmental law obligations uh, that the investor owed to the state. And therefore, um, this form of counterclaim in the Ubisar case was not accepted by the tribunal. So um, just, just taking a step back and looking at the Ubisar case and the Burlington case that, that, that we just discussed, um, it's, it, it's quite evident that as of now, and this may change as we see more cases that concern environmental law issues, uh, that, that, that most environmental treaty, that, 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 that there are difficulties in advancing um, environmental issue-based counterclaims just based on applicable international law, and that it's helpful when you're sort of advancing that kind of a claim to have local law supporting um, your case. And, and, and that's, a, that's a difficulty that's cited by many practitioners. But, but of course, um, as uh, Professor Reed, uh, Reed mentioned at the outset, um, these, uh, these trends, the current trends may are subject to change and, um, and are subject to change as this, the impact of environmental issues uh, becomes more prominent and severe in investment treaty um, arbitrations. Um, next slide, please. So I guess the second form, or I guess the, the more traditional form that, that uh, of investment um, treat, uh, environmental issues in investment treaty obligations is, uh, is uh, the, the investor enforcing environmental obligations against the states. And the, just the moving on to the next slide. Um, so because there's no significant issue with how that can be done, it's, it's, it's similar or the same as any other investment treaty arbitrations. Um, the, the critical issue then becomes, uh, what's the source of the obligation? What's the source of the breach? And um, in, in the, as you can see, um, the, in the Allard versus Barbados, the Unicentral case, um, the investor claimed damages for the state's failure to comply with environmental obligations, as in, was based on the argument that because the state had not withheld uh, or failed to, to, to abide by environmental regulations on um, the investor suffered losses uh, with regard to its investment in the state. Now, this claim, as you can see from the slide here, was dismissed uh, for the failure to discharge burden of proof, but it just shows uh, that uh, that, that even that the state's failure to abide by environmental regulations can be a source of claim in the investment treaty um, um, forum. Um, the second, I guess, for the second category would be investors advanced claim for breach of environmental norm by reference of investment protection obligations, which is saying that a breach or failure to abide by environmental regulations amounts to uh, a breach of the main, the principles that are mainly disputed in investment treaty arbitrations. Um, for instance, the breach of minimum standard of treatment. And that was, I guess, exactly what was um, um, disputed in the Bilcon case and the NAFTA case. Uh, it's a famous case. I think um, many of us know how it played out where uh, the NAFTA tribunal accepted uh, the investments arguments that Canada had breached the, the environmental and that amounted to a breach of uh, of the minimum standard of treatment and other principles, but um, but this the, the, but this award is off, is of course being challenged in the Canadian courts. But it, it's a significant significant case because it shows that that a breach of of environmental regulations can amount to a breach in the, of uh, investment treaty principles, and and that can amount to. Um, uh, an entitlement to loss, uh, a recovery of loss in the investment treaty um, forum. So 
those are the two um, two biggest categories that you see where investors enforce um, environmental obligations against the state. So. Um, I think um, that the takeaway or the, of my presentation, if, if there are any, and I guess I'm the only one using slides right now, but, uh, but uh, it's just that um, there, are, I, I, there, there are a lot of interesting developments concerning environment. And as, as Professor um, Lucy Reed said at the outset, uh, we're, we're going to see more of this as, as more cases involve environmental issues. And I guess for, 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 protect, for practitioners, uh, this is something to take heed in working with clients and working with uh, our colleagues. And for, for younger practitioners, I guess, coming up and, and as students, uh, young say students, I think it's one of the uh, topics that, 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 you, that, like, you know, that, that needs to be taken into greater interest and uh, it's something that you can sort of um, uh, have as your, your area of practice as you come onto the scene and start your practice. So those are some of my takeaways. Um, and uh, that's all I have, but uh, thank you very much uh, for the time. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Munji. Um, and since um, you still have the floor, <laughs> uh, I pose uh, a question that has been raised uh, from the audience. Um, and someone has asked, um, what advantages, if any, are there for states who pursue these counterclaims in arbitration as opposed to their own court systems? Are you on mute, Mujay? Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. So, so I think um, it's. Um, I think the states would have an advantage of having this as a counterclaim because. Of course, um, coming to the courts is an option, but like you just just based on technicality, I think from a first from a technicality pr perspective, um, if there is an arbitration clause, if if uh, if an investments treaty um, case has already been preceded, I think there is an advantage for the states to sort of resolve all the issues in that forum, and in that in that respect, there is an advantage. Um, for the state to sort of present this as a counterclaim, as opposed to um, as opposed to filing a separate um, court proceeding against the investor, where, which I, I would imagine can entail um, uh, complicated um, jurisdictional issues, and so I would think that would be the second, the, the first advantage for a state to have uh, this as a counterclaim. I think the second um, counterclaim. Uh, the second advantage that you can take uh, as, as, as a state is um, by having this as, it's so, somewhat more of a strategic point, I think, is that by having this as a subject in the investment treaty arbitration, it can give you a sword, if you, if you call it, like, you know, because you're in the defensive uh, in an investment treaty arbitration, but by having your sword uh, as having this as a counterclaim, it gives you to sort of like, you know, work with, like, you know, against uh, the, the investor, like, you know, in, in, in sort of giving the impression that, that look, like, you know, this is the overall picture. It's not just what the investor is saying in, in, in his, in its claims. So I would think that those are some of the advantage that, that sort of come to mind as in having a, invest, having a counterclaim as opposed to court proceeding. But uh, I am, um, I'm more than happy to hear other views on this. Okay. Um, unless, um, you know, any of um, our panelists have a you know, a view on the question that's been posed. Uh, can I perhaps then um, pose this question to Lucy and, and maybe Michelle as well? Um, you know, so the question is that given the fact that we're usually bound to our clients' preferences, what are some incentives other than financial that we can list, which can convince them greener arbitration is in their best interests? Thank you, and, and yes, let me let me jump in on on that one. I thought it was a very interesting question when I when I saw it uh, pop up. Um, what Michelle touched on this when she mentioned ESG principles, environmental, social, and governance principles, and this is something that we are seeing that companies are really putting in front and center of their businesses. It's a it's a performance matrix they are increasingly being judged on, and so. My, my initial response would be that this is something that wouldn't 
shouldn't take a lot of convincing of this for clients uh, that they should be adopting because of the synergies with uh, the overarching ESG principles. And, and the question is very interesting because it says, what are some incentives other than financial? But I would like to just touch on the financial aspect, if, if you'll permit me, because one part of our research, um, I mentioned we looked at the environmental impact of uh, major international arbitration. We, that was our case study. and We have our findings that I touched upon from that. We then re-ran our numbers on a green basis. And, and it wasn't even a very extreme green basis. It was one less flight um, taken at every stage of the arbitration and it was no printed bundles, but we did factor in the cost of hosting an electronic um, platform for the, for the electronic bundles. And even with those small green changes, uh, we found that there was a saving in disbursement costs of, of roughly 40%. So uh, that we found that very, very interesting. And it's not actually something we have particularly um, publicized yet. Um, we will be doing that. It, I will say that it was only disbursement costs. We suspect there would have been a significant reduction in lawyer costs as well simply because you're not investing the time in checking the bundles, getting the couriers out, you know, you're catching the flights, all, all that, that, all those things that really soak up lawyer time, they probably shouldn't, but they do. Um, so uh, those, those are my thoughts on that. There, there is a significant financial incentive uh, that probably the campaign needs to um, hammer home a bit more, uh, but also you have this, um, uh, more um, overarching principle that companies are signing up to, which is that they need to demonstrate their commitments to environmental, social, and, and proper government principles. Shell, do you have anything to add? Um, yeah, no, I, th I think those were all great points, um, especially you know with regard to the financial incentives. I had also noted that we didn't want to talk about it, but it seemed like how could you ignore them? Um, one other thing I, I might add is speed. I think you can also run your arbitration faster if you don't need to worry about flying every, if, if particularly if you're using remote hearings and you don't need to fly everybody into the same city, meaning that you have to find an entire week or two um, to block off on people's calendars. So I think you can definitely run your arbitration faster, get through the steps to hearing quicker um, and get an award quicker if you are looking at having a virtual or remote hearing. Do you think, Michelle, you know, that it is, you know, uh, somewhat innovative, but do you think, you know, there would be a possibility that institutions may be prepared, for instance, to uh, offer financial incentives, you know, if parties are prepared to, uh, you know, commit uh, to greener arbitrations, for instance, cutting down on, you know, physical hearings, you know, mm -hmm. You know, again, I don't speak for the institution here, um, <laughs> but my personal view is, you know, the administrative fees, um, you know, don't really take into account those kinds of hearings and so forth. So I, I don't foresee um, that, but I think where it could come into play is, you know, maybe the cost of the arbitration could include offsetting, for example. If, if a hearing is to be held virtually. And I think that could be a financial aspect um, that changes. Um, also, uh, you know, the, the, the cost of the arbitration will be lower without the, the travel costs of the tribunal. Um, so there's an obvious financial incentive on the sort of on the institutional side, but it's really an expense of the tribunal. Sure. Um, Lisa, I, I had a question for you, and I was just wondering whether you could share with us, you know, whether there have been any specific challenges uh, that you've come across in seeking to persuade, you know, those of us in the arbitration community to to make these necessary changes, and you know, uh, and and how have you sought to address some of these challenges? Yes, uh, Sean, and it, it is a great question um, because we have had a little bit of pushback on occasion and, and that's partly why when I started this process uh, with the great help of, of DECA LLP and, and a great team there, I, I have to say, 
we deliberately conducted this very detailed environmental impact analysis, this case study I've, I've touched upon, because I know we are dealing with cynical lawyers who, who will sort of say, well, where, where's, your, where's your evidence for that, Lucy? You can't just come in here and say, oh, we've got to change. Um, show me why. And so we've very much be taken, uh, I, I guess, quite a scientific approach to the issue deliberately. Uh, and I have to say with that, yes, there was a little bit of pushback in, and again, I mentioned this briefly in my presentation that, oh, it's not representative of, of most arbitration proceedings. They're not $30 million cases like the case study you, you and your team took, Lucy. Um, but a certain amount of pushback from that, um, as I said, I'm not interested in sort of nitpicking over whether it's 20,000 trees or 10,000 trees. I, I'm interested in, in people actually taking, it's a headline figure, it gets people's attention, but the important thing is that we understand that it's, it's about taking personal responsibility. And I think for too long, the industry has sort of sat back and, and said, oh, well, the clients want us to do this, the clients want us to fly. As, as Michelle said, you know, a long haul flight for a one hour procedural hearing. And, and somebody has to say, well, is that really the case? Um, so, so overwhelmingly, the response to the campaign has been incredible. And uh, I, I cannot you know, overstate the importance of the amazing people on the, on the steering committee. We have a global steering committee of over 45 individuals, incredibly diverse and diverse in all senses of the word, um, deliberately chosen to, to, to represent all sorts of different interests and stakeholders in the community. And I think that has really helped us uh, get the message out. Um, and yeah, I've just been overwhelmed by the, by the support. Um, I think we have just a minute or so left. Um, and maybe could I just pose a question to Yutanjali? Um, one of the things that you mentioned was obviously in international commercial arbitration, privacy and confidentiality is fundamental. Uh, but you had also touched on, I guess, the uh, public interest in perhaps, you know, uh, having uh, awards, you know, being published, I suppose, you know, having some that, that sort of precedent value. Um, any suggestions on how that could be addressed? Look, sure. I think um, we see this already in the investor arbitration. You do have exit awards that are published. Uh, of course, this has been a sensitive issue in the international commercial arbitration community. Um, and some institutions have taken uh, publishing certain details. So for example, in the ICC, you can have details about the arbitrators, about the case, etc. cetera. Um, I think the only with the amount of debate that has existed on this topic before it even became a question of public interest in relation to climate change related disputes, the way it would have to be done is on the on a case by case basis. So if you are looking at a, a climate change related disputes, institutional rules could provide for certain orders or draft orders or procedural orders that the tribunal can adopt um, to, to, to say that certain documents in a particular climate change related proceedings can be uh, can be published. Um, and now there are different ways of achieving it. You could have this as orders that are adopted in procedural rules. I've also seen you know, references where you could have, if you know that your contract is only going to give, give rise to such climate change related public interest disputes, the party is actually drafting arbitration clauses, which might have a provision on how confidentiality will work in that particular arbitration. So you're either um, doing it head on at the time of drafting the clause, or you have an opportunity there for the parties in the tribunal to agree or the tribunal to impose certain orders providing for certain transparency. And I think uh, at this stage, that is something which will be acceptable to most of the community, uh, if not all. Great. Well, I'm conscious that we've come to the end uh, uh, of the session. Um, it's been a pleasure to, you know, a moderate session. Uh, my, I want to express my thanks to the panelists, Lucy, Michelle, Jitanjali, and Wujie. Um, you know, it's, it's been a pleasure um, speaking uh, with all of you this afternoon. Over to you, Sanjay. Thank you, Mr. Chu, Sean, you and speakers for your insightful work. 
It is time to take a short break before we begin our second session and we will resume at 3.50 sharp. Thank you. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Now we will begin our second session, Tips for Young Practitioners, Building Blocks and Stepping Stones in International Arbitration. Our moderator is Ms. Hemi Kim. She's a partner at Lee & Co's International Arbitration and Litigation Group in Korea. I now pass the mic to Ms. Kim. Thank you for the introduction, Samjin. Um, good afternoon, good evening, and good morning, wherever you are in the world. Um, I'm Sami Kim from Lee & Co, and I'm very pleased to welcome you all to the second session today. Um, for the second session, um, we have a stunning panel to share their valuable experience and tips with our young practitioners. Um, first, we have Mr. Suresh Divyanelsen, a partner at Unem Basul in Singapore, who is the head of the firm's international arbitration practice. Um, our second session, uh, our second speaker is Mr. Taro Tru, a partner in the international arbitration practice of Sherman Sterling and head of the Singapore office. We will then hear from Ms. Kushbu Shaptapuri, a senior associate of Al Tamimi and Company's International Arbitration Department in Dubai. Last but not least, um, we will have uh, Mr. Ujay Kim again from uh, Bay Kim and Lee in Seoul. Um, sorry, uh, we I think we will have to apologize for this last minute. Um, change, but um, unfortunately, our last speaker, Mr. Bhushan Satish, uh, could not be able, uh, could not uh, join today, but we have an incredible speaker, Mr. Kim, to share more uh, tips, so we will uh, invite him as our last speaker. Um, before we dive in, let me remind our audience to submit live questions during the presentation through the Q&A poll. Um, and uh, I hope we could have a short Q&A session, maybe long, um, at the end of each presentation. Um, without further ado, I would like to invite Mr. Suresh Divyanathan to address the first topic, tips for students. Suresh, um, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Sami. Hi, everybody. Um, so I think I've got uh, I've got some slides to help with. Help. Um, right there we go. So the topic I've been asked to present on is tips for students who want to practice uh, international arbitration. Um, so let's go ahead into the slides. Next slide, please. All right, so broadly speaking, what I'm gonna cover, sorry, it's, it all says one. <laughs> um, they're all equally important, in other words. So I'll just be covering three topics, what to know, who to know, and what else we're looking for. So I'll start with the first one, what to know. Next slide, please. Right, so the problem um, is this. This, this is, this topic is being geared towards students and the question that I have for you is, what are the optional subjects you should be studying in law school? So, you know, the way most law schools work is that the first year, you have um, all compulsory subjects that kind of give you the foundation into legal practice. And then from your second year or certainly your third year, uh, you will have a whole bunch of optional subjects and, and then you have to choose, you know, which are the subjects that, that you wish to study. So the question here is, which are the optional subjects that you should choose to study um, if you wanna practice international arbitration? So next slide. Okay, so the problem, the problem really is this. You could go broadly speaking one of two ways. The first way, is you could take a deep, deep dive into some serious hard law topic and you know just go straight down the rabbit hole. You could effectively learn more and more about less and less until you know absolutely everything about practically nothing. The, the topic is so deep and so detailed um, that 
that's you know that's the only thing that you really really got a, a firm grasp on when you're in law school that's one way you could go next slide the other way of course is the opposite you could look at all the optional subjects and you could say well you know this looks interesting and that looks interesting and that other thing looks interesting as well um, and so you could end up learning less and less about more and more topics until you know nothing about absolutely everything, right? So the first one is you go very, very deep into one subject. And the second one is you take such a broad brush approach into many, many different subjects um, that you know nothing about everything. Okay, next slide. All right, so what you should really be doing, of course, is finding the right balance between all the competing interests, right? Uh, in, in fact, that statement, finding the right balance between all competing interests, it, it's something that you can see in any meetings when you weren't paying attention. Anytime, you know, um, if you're dozing off in a Zoom call um, and after a while somebody asks you a question, by the way, you know, Suresh, what do you think of this? And if you weren't paying attention, you just say, you know, at the end of the day, we just need to find the right balance between all competing interests. And everybody will nod sagely and go, yes, yes, that's correct. That's correct. I mean, totally meaningless statement, right? But what does that actually mean when it comes to choosing topics in law school to study? Um, okay, so next slide. Right, so what is law school for, actually? If you think about it, what is the purpose of law school? It's really not so much to study uh, and know the law uh, in, in, in hard law subjects. That's not what I think law school is for. Because um, I can throw a question to any first year associate I have. It can be on an area of law that they never studied at all. But by tomorrow morning, they will find me the right answer, right? I mean, if you give them the whole night to work at it, they'll eventually find the right answer for me, whatever area of law it may be. And so that is the skill that they picked up, they learned how to do that when they were in law school. So in my view, actually, the purpose of law school isn't so much to teach you, you know, hard law in, in some deep subject somewhere. The real purpose of law school is to teach you how to find the law, where to go to look for the law. So I can ask you a question on insurance law and you've never studied insurance law before, but hopefully by the time you finish law school, and if I give you overnight, you know how to go and find the answer, right? You know uh, to go pull out certain textbooks, you know to go do uh, legal research uh, into some online tools, and eventually you'll be able to find me the answer by the next morning when I come back into the office. You know, you may have been there the whole night, but that's that's your level. That's that's not my problem. So that's the purpose of law school, to teach you how to go and find the law, right? Now. If you take that perspective, then what are the subjects you should be studying in law school if you want to get into international arbitration? Next slide. Right. So in my view, you, you shouldn't really be taking that many hard law subjects because they are not really going to be that relevant or you're not sure whether they'll ever be relevant in the, in the type of cases that you'll be practicing in. The really only two hard law subjects that I think are, are, are probably quite useful. The first is if there's a course on international commercial arbitration, go take, go take that course, you know, obviously. And the second one actually is conflicts of laws. In international arbitration, in my view, very often we come across all sorts of issues of conflicts of laws, right? Uh, you have the question of, of, uh, of uh, where the substantive law of the contract ends and where the law of the seat of arbitration uh, uh, begins, right? And how the two interact with each other. Um, how do you calculate damages? Is it according to the substantive law of the contract or is it according to the, to the seat of the arbitration? Um, issues like that. So an understanding of conflicts of laws, I think is, is helpful. But even if you don't study that, that is still perfectly fine. What should you be doing with the rest of your optional subjects in law school. My view is, since you already know how to go and find the answer to any question at law, you don't have to study that many hard law subjects. What you should really be studying is 
all the practical skills subjects. Those are the things that you need years and years and years of training to do. And it's helpful to get a head start on that by learning them in law school. So if there is a class on advocacy, go take that. If there's a class on negotiation, go take that. Go and do international mooting competitions, right? There's a Jessup moots, there's Viz moots, there's a whole bunch of them nowadays. Um, on a non-law subject, I think learning about valuation and damages calculation uh, is useful. You know, many of the cases we do in international arbitration, uh, a big part of the fight is not just about liability, but it's also about the calculation of damages. So if you learn uh, how valuations are done, if you understand what your expert witness is saying, uh, and you're able to cross-examine the opposing expert on on their valuation of, of the company and their calculation of damages, you know, th those I think are, are, are useful subjects uh, to, go, to go and learn as well. And they're not necessarily law subjects. I mean, you might have to walk into, into a business school or accountancy school and see if you can pick up an optional um, uh, topic on that. And the last one um, that I've got on this list here is mediation. Um, in my view, mediation is the next big thing. What we are seeing is that a lot of arbitration users um, are concerned about the cost of arbitration and, and the time taken to go through an arbitration. Um, there are also issues of enforceability of arbitral awards in various jurisdictions. Um, and, you know, they, these are business people. So they don't want to spend a lot of money and a lot of time to get an uncertain result, right? I mean, if, if they can spend two years in an arbitration and they don't know what the result's going to be until they get the arbitral award, and then after that, they've got to go into enforcement and, and that, may not be, that may not be very straightforward as well. So a lot of arbitration users, in my view, are turning more and more towards mediation and at least trying to uh, mediate the dispute at some point in the arbitral process. It could be near the start, it could be, it could be just before the arbitral hearing uh, takes place. So after you have all the witness statements uh, and all the expert witness reports and all of that, and, and uh, the parties have a much clearer idea of where the strengths and weaknesses of their case are, you know, that might be another point where they choose to do mediation, um, not just at the start of the matter. So I think mediation um, is, the next big thing, and I, and I think you know, doing a course on mediation or learning about mediation uh, is, is potentially useful um, for international arbitration practitioners because you will come across mediations in, in your work quite often. Um, in fact, you know, Singapore um, is, is very sure that mediation is going to be, is going to be a big deal. Um, and that's part of the reason why we sponsored the United Nations uh, Convention on Mediation. It's now called the Singapore Convention on Mediation, but Singapore was the country that was the driving force behind the adoption of this mediation convention. Um, and, and it you know, formally was adopted uh, as an international treaty in 2019. I think there were 47 initial signatories uh, to the convention, which, which was a very good start. But the point of this slide broadly is it's really not so much about the hard law subjects. It's more about the practical skills that you need to learn. And so if you waste too much time just studying hard law subjects, I don't think they're necessarily meaningful. I would suggest that you go take more of the practical causes and learn the, the, the practical skills you will need uh, in international arbitration, if you're interested in international arbitration, right? So that's my view. Next slide. Okay, so that, that covers um, what to know. Now, if you talk about who to know, um, you know, I, I've put some names here on the slide. It's, um, it's not exhaustive, obviously. The point is this, what you know is only half the story. Who you know is just as important, okay? Uh, I, I know that's not, a, that's not a particularly nice thing to say, but, but it is true. Um, you have to get to know people and you have to get to know the right people so that you can get the right opportunities to go and do the thing you want to do, which is international arbitration in this case. So, you know, just, just knowing stuff isn't enough. You have to get to know the right people. 
and, and who are the right people? So they actually fall into several groups. The first group is law firms, right? Go and do internships in law firms. Go and do as many internships in law firms that, that um, have a big and busy uh, international arbitration practice. Um, go and do as many internships as you can so that you get exposure to the way that they practice international arbitration and, and they get to know who you are. Um, it's, it's much better for them uh, to assess you whether, whether they want to hire you as an associate thereafter, uh, if they have an opportunity to assess you as an intern to begin with, right? So um, I, I put some names of law firms here. Again, it's not exhaustive. Obviously, you know, Lee & Co is a, another great law firm in Korea uh, that does a lot of international arbitration as well. Um, but what you do is you can just go and, and look up Global Arbitration Review, right? GAR 30, GAR 100. You can see the list of firms there, and these are the firms that are generally uh, people think do a lot of international arbitration. See if you can get internships with them. Um, so that is one, one group of people you need to get to know. The second group um, that could be useful is, is if you volunteer to act as tribunal secretary uh, for some of the, the, the arbitrators who do a lot of uh, arbitration work. Um, you know, so I've, I've listed some names here. Again, not exhaustive. You know, Michael Huang, uh, Dr. Michael Moser, you know, people like that. Um, and you basically volunteer to, to, to be an intern for them or to be their tribunal secretary, uh, whatever it may be. But then you get, you know, that, that perspective where you are able to see um, them presiding over arbitrations um, and, and you get kind of the inside track to how, you know, arbitration hearings uh, are done. Because if you go uh, to a law firm as an intern, you may never see the inside of an arbitral hearing, right? Um, it really depends on whether the case that you are working on, you know, actually goes to a hearing at the time that you are still an intern there. But if you if you if you act as tribunal secretary for for any of the arbitrators, you know, um, primarily they require your help during the arbitration or, or the very close lead up towards the arbitration uh, itself. So, so that's also a good perspective um, to, to, to be able to take a look at. The third group um, is the arbitral institutes. Um, so, you know, I've listed SIAC, LCIA, obviously ICC, you know, um, arbitral institutes like that. So if you could, if you could do an internship with them, or um, if you could, if you could go um, act for them as, as a, as a administrator, a, a case administrator, um, you know, or an assistant case administrator or something like that. Um, that gives you uh, another perspective on the practice of international arbitration. Uh, you see how arbitration cases are administered by the arbitral institutes. Um, and um, I think in that regard, you know, some of the, some of the more interesting aspects of that, um, which you wouldn't see elsewhere, um, is first how the arbitral institute uh, goes about their procedure for appointment of arbitrators and especially goes about their procedure for appointment of an emergency arbitrator uh, if there's a particularly urgent case or an urgent decision that is needed uh, on a new case. So getting an understanding of how that procedure works, how they select the arbitrators, uh, I think is, is, a, is, a, is a good insight that you wouldn't get you know, from, from the, other, the other two groups that I mentioned. Um, the second area is award scrutiny. So if you, if you are interning or you work for, you know, for six months or for a year for one of these arbitral institutes, um, you probably have the opportunity to do some award scrutiny, um, which is where the arbitrators have finished drafting their award and they send the award to the arbitral institution for the arbitral institution to release to the parties. And before the award is released to the parties, um, the arbitral institution will, will examine the award, scrutinize the award just to make sure that, that um, you know, all, all the formalities uh, in an arbitral award uh, are properly captured in the award before they release the award, right? Um, and, and that reduces the chances of uh, confusion or, uh, or um, applications to set and sign an award for a fundamental problem in the award. Um, so, you know, that gives you the opportunity to then see um, a lot more international arbitration awards um, than you, you probably otherwise would 
um, if if you if you were to just be an intern in a law firm. So so I think these are three different groups um, that are interesting to intern with or to work for, you know, for, for some period of time, um, because they give you different perspectives and they make you a, um, a more well-rounded uh, uh, arbitration practitioner, or at least a young person, you know, trying to get into an international arbitration practice. Okay, so that's, that's uh, my view on who to know. Um, next slide. So this is the last topic, what else we're looking for. Now, um, I'm not going to cover all the usual stuff um, that you would look for in any um, new lawyer joining your law firm. So, you know, things like being a team player, having integrity, having drive and all of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you know all of that. And that is the same uh, for any new joiner of a law firm, regardless of your practice area. So, you know, I'm, I don't need to cover that. The question really is, the more interesting question is, if you want to get into international arbitration, what are the other things that, that um, the arbitration teams in law firms, I think, would be interested in, uh, in, in knowing about you, which would give, you know, your CV um, an advantage? The first really is um, multilingualism. So in other words, if you're not just an English speaker, but you're fluent in Mandarin as well, or fluent in Korean or Japanese or Hindi, you know, or Bahasa Indonesia. Um, so uh, fluency in, in two or perhaps three languages, that will be interesting. That will be a standout. The reason for that is because in an international arbitration practice, you, you, deal, with, uh, you deal with clients uh, from many different jurisdictions and, and some practices, some law firms, um, you know, their practice might focus more on clients from one particular region um, where fluency in that native language you know, is particularly useful for them uh, because a lot of the documents are, are going to be in that native language uh, to begin with. And, Yes, they will eventually need to be translated into English, but it's great to have people who can, who can read the documentation, um, you know, the, the correspondence between the parties, uh, all in that native language first, and be able to pick out what are the important pieces of correspondence that the senior members of the team, you know, need to zoom in on very quickly um, and, and examine. So that's particularly useful. Um, the other thing that I find is that if you are if you are multilingual, chances are you have a much better ear at understanding different accents, different English accents. Um, and that is important because you could have witnesses um, and you could have expert witnesses who come from um, a different cultural background and, and speak English um, with, a, with a particular accent. Uh, and, you know, I've had I've had cases where um, I can easily understand what the witness is saying with that accent because that's part of my cultural background. But then I have great difficulty understanding what someone else is saying with a different accent. You know, they're both speaking English, but just different accents uh, because I have no familiarity with, with that language, um, which, which, is their, or which is their native language. And then the, that, that uh, sort of adds an accent to the way that they speak English. So um, I think if you're, if you're multilingual, you have a better chance at being able to understand the different accents that you would come across uh, in international arbitration practice. Uh, and that's very helpful, basically just to avoid misunderstanding what someone is really trying to say. The other useful thing about multilingualism is, I think if, if, you, are, if you are fluent in a language, um, then you have a... Uh, uh, then you have the ability to understand the cultural nuances of that particular culture as well. So, for example, if, you're, if you do a lot of business with the Japanese, um, you would know that there are people who are non-confrontational and they very often don't like to say no in their correspondence. They don't like to say that the other party is the one in breach of the contract. Um, so, you know, having that cultural understanding is useful. And um, the second picture on the right, 
is actually court craft. In other words, the ability to be fluent, extremely fluent in English, uh, and the ability to cross-examine in English. There are many, many areas of international arbitration that you can do without being the lead counsel. You know, you could do great work in research and witness uh, preparation, uh, preparing witness statements and document management, things like that, right? Uh, drafting the memorials. But if you want to be the lead counsel, then fluency in English and um, a background where you have learned court craft, learning how to cross-examine, how to make the big strategy decisions in a case, I think that's particularly useful, right? Uh, but for students, you know, that, that's difficult to pick up, but that's just something to bear in mind if you want to be, if you want to be the lead counsel in international arbitration. And that's basically it. Last slide. Yeah, that's my personal motto. Don't hate, arbitrate. Uh, I've got to come up with a motto for mediation, haven't yet. Um, and, you know, so generic disclaimer, uh, basically everything I've said is my personal view. Um, other people may have different views. It's, it's always helpful to hear different views from different people. Um, but if you have any questions uh, and if you want to challenge any of my views, I'm perfectly happy to answer anything. Thank you very much. Thank you for the interesting presentation, Suresh. And thank you for not forgetting to mention Lee and Co. <laughs> um, especially your slides were very entertaining. Um, as uh, the interest of time, I would just have one question for you. You you encourage the students to do internship. Um, do you have any practical tips for them um, to uh, make the most out of their internship? How to stand out among other interns? Um, I think just basically, um, you know, be. Uh, the person who's prepared to do all the extra work um you know uh, if you have a lot of interns who are very shy and um they just do the work that's assigned to them and they and they don't dare to interact with anyone else um and if they don't have much work to do they just sit there quietly and they just wait until some work comes their way but you know i i think it you should really be the person who says hey i finished this what's next give me the next thing give me the next thing um, and that way you learn as much as you can. And, uh, and you know, people will notice that, you know, you've got, you've got a eager beaver here that, uh, that hopefully the work you're doing is good. Um, then they want to give you even more work. That's a very good point. Thank you so much. Now let's move on to our next topic, uh, tips for young practitioners. Um, please welcome Mr. Daryl Chu to share his tips. Daryl, handing over to you. Thank you, Sami, and good afternoon, everyone. Good morning to those of you who are elsewhere. It's a pleasure to be here, and thank you to the organizers for the kind invitation. Now, as, as Lucy mentioned in her keynote address, the theme of today's event is, is timely. It's adapting to changing paradigms in arbitration. But amidst these significant changes, I think some of the foundational building blocks um, for young practitioners remain constant, and some would say are more important than ever. Now, there are many possible topics to discuss, and there is no one right answer or one path. But what I will aim to do is to share some tips on three main categories. They are acquiring and honing your professional skills. It's building your profile and reputation and working with the team and clients. Now, the choice of these categories reflect questions and conversations that I've had with younger practitioners. Indeed, some lessons that I have learned from them over the years. Unsurprisingly, some themes overlap with Suresh's presentation. And Suresh, I, I really like the presentation, I find it very entertaining. Um, and Kushbu will share with you some war stories as well. Hopefully, the diversity of views and perspectives will be helpful for each of you to find what works for you. Now, ideally, this will not be some sort of a lecture or monologue, but a conversation. And I really invite all of you to pose questions to the group um, using the chat function as, as we go along. So let's start with the first category, acquiring and honing your professional skills. As a young practitioner, after law school, basically the goal is to try and become the best lawyer you can be. And it's a long journey. It's an accretive one. Along the way, you will acquire a wide range of practical skills. It's legal research, it's advocacy, 
uh, written and oral. It could be cross-examination, legal analysis, project management, and so on. But what are some ways to do this or to accelerate your learning? I guess five tips. The first is take every opportunity to learn as much as you can from anyone, everyone. It could be mentors, it could be co-counsel, it could be opposing counsel, it could be senior arbitrators, it could be your colleagues, but be deliberate and observe skilled professionals. Digest what they're doing. Basically reflect on what he or she did well, what was effective, right? If you attend a hearing and you see someone who is a really good storyteller, an excellent advocate, reflect on what he or she has done well and try and learn from that, right? The second tip is be disciplined in building your knowledge base. We can't learn everything overnight. So because it's an accretive process, try and be disciplined in doing that and take time to be apprised of developments in the field. Attend webinars such as these. You know, there are many YSIAC webinars which are very accessible. Try and set yourself a goal, for example, attend one a week. Now, over time, these things add up. So read, read about case developments, attend mock hearings. It's not just legal cases, try and broaden your horizons. I know of students, I have colleagues who set themselves a goal of reading the Economist cover to cover every week. Now over time that really adds up. The third tip is learn by doing, right? You don't learn advocacy by attending a course. You learn by doing more. The more you do, the more you learn. So try and be brave and say yes to as many things as you can. Volunteer to prepare a submissions outline, for example. Ask to discuss case strategy. Now think deeply about a case if you're involved. Don't just do what you're assigned to, as, as Suresh mentioned, but don't be afraid to offer your observations in a group setting. Test your observations, defend them. If you're interested in the mediation process, offer to participate in one or to help out or offer to be a tribunal secretary, for example. Basically take ownership, try and create your own opportunities and try and move out of your comfort zone because that's what leads to growth. And finally, I would say, try and find a mentor or several mentors, both within your organization and outside the organization. Right, ask not just for feedback about what you have done, ask for help. So there's this concept called the feed forward concept. If you are going to do something, say preparing a cross-examination outline, ask a mentor what you should take into account when preparing it, right? So you don't just ask for feedback after you have done it, ask people for tips or guidance as to what you should take into account before you approach it, a particular task. So that's kind of acquiring and honing your professional skills as a young practitioner. Now, second category, building your profile and reputation. And I would say one of the most important principles is do good work, do your best work, right? Really, that's the way to earn the respect of your peers and goes a long way to building your own personal brand. Try and integrate with a larger community. Now, there are many committees out there to join. And, and give back. Ultimately, it's a very small community. So whether you try and join a, a young practitioner organization, try and organize an event. I mean, I'm sure the whole process of organizing an event like this um, was very fulfilling. Um, and all of this will help build bonds for you for the future and also improve your visibility. Essentially, the more you give, the, the more you will get back, the more you learn. So volunteer to speak, to write, to mentor others younger than you, and try and start as early as possible. In terms of building your network, it's really all about forging authentic relationships, right? Work at them. There is no magic formula. As Suresh mentioned, it, it's who you know, but it takes effort. It also requires kind of cultural sensitivity. I mean, in, in the course of your career, you will work with very diverse teams across different cultures, multiple nationalities. 
right? Approaching all of these interactions with some degree of humility and open mind is, is quite important. And finally, working with team and clients. I think in, in most of your professional life, you will be working with a team, with colleagues, with clients, and your ability to do so effectively will be key, right? In a good team, you can achieve a lot more. So try and be an enthusiastic and generous team member, team player, see yourself as part of a team that collectively needs to get a job done, uh, no matter what or by whom and regardless of hierarchy. When you're interacting with clients, try and learn about your client's businesses, show an interest in understanding their aims and priorities, try and understand the bigger picture, right? What are they trying to achieve commercially? So those are some quick tips on each of the three categories. Um, I hope they have given you one or two key takeaways to, to chew on. Um, at the end of the day, it's, it's about taking small steps in the right direction, right? It's not about one huge step, it's about steady progress. It's accretive, don't be afraid to, to take chances and, and make mistakes. I apologize for some uh, background noise. Uh, again, it's, it's not one path, no, no magic formula. Um, I would say don't, don't get too obsessed in, in comparing your career progress to those of your peers. It's really not a race. Challenge yourself to be better than who you were before and enjoy the work and become better at it. And I hope you find fulfillment. Thank you. Thank you for sharing the insightful tips, Daryl. Um, those are very encouraging and um, very practical. Um, I, I have one question for you, maybe two. Um, regarding your second point on building profile, um, as you mentioned, um, it's, well, you said there's no magic formula, but um, it's different these days since most of us are living in a virtual world. So do you have any tips to give on how we can um, best adapt or even benefit from this new development in terms of networking? Thanks, Amy. I think the advent of, of technology gives um, us all actually more opportunities, right? Before you had to you know, fly for hours to attend a conference to meet people. Now there are literally conferences and events happening every day and you can attend, attend them across different time zones. Um, organizers have also become quite creative in terms of networking. I've seen a few virtual networking events where you are broken up into different breakout rooms and you get to meet people across jurisdictions. So I think this actually gives younger practitioners more of an opportunity um, to meet a wide range of practitioners. Now, obviously it's not the same as meeting in person and you may not be able to build the same degree of rapport, but I would say make the most of it, attend these conferences and follow up, right? So after you have met someone virtually, uh, make an effort to keep in touch, uh, to stay in contact. And at some point you will meet the person, you will be able to catch up in person and be able to build upon uh, what, what you had already done. So pros and cons, but I, I think there's a silver lining behind some of these developments. Thank you very much. Um, now let's move on to our next topic. Um, bearing in mind the earlier tips we've heard from Daryl and Suresh, um, let's now hear the true war stories from Ms. Kushbu Shadapuri. Um, Kushbu, whenever you're ready. Thank you, Semi. Good afternoon, everyone. I am absolutely delighted to be a part of YAD 2021 today. So for today's presentation, I'm going to focus on the younger practitioners. I do have a couple of points directed at students at the end, but of course, everything I say for the younger practitioners are equally relevant to students. Now, in today's landscape, the supply of very talented lawyers is more than the demand, unfortunately. So for most young lawyers trying to break into international arbitration, it's important that when you get your foot in the door, you take every single advantage of that opportunity and become somebody that your organization or your firm trusts. This is not just relevant for junior lawyers. There will always be certain people in various seniorities in an organization that senior leadership and management of the firm trusts. So in other words, these people have become the trusted aides of that firm and will eventually become a valuable member of that organization. 
to become this person, that's a combination of things that you should definitely be doing. And those are what Daryl and Suresh have already touched on. So I'm going to focus on things that you should definitely be avoiding to become somebody that your organization or firm trusts. So trust is really the undertone of my entire presentation today. And that's probably a good juncture for me to move on to specific war stories I'd like to share in today's presentation. So for my first story, I'm going to speak a little bit more about arbitration groups that every young lawyer is encouraged to get involved in. And there are some excellent platforms that, that I think Suresh has already spoken about, like young ICA mentoring or writing, doing summaries of awards or journals in IT or Plua. And ultimately, the arbitration community is a small circle. So these are really great ways to get to know your colleagues. But the goal of these groups are to further your practice and not vice versa. And I cannot emphasize this enough. So as, as practicing lawyers, what we term as, I suppose, billable work, it's basically ongoing matters that generate fees for the firm should always be prioritized. And there was a case we did years ago at a time when we were extremely short staffed. It wasn't a season for interns because it was a university term. So we had to divide our resources in a various number of urgent matters and deadlines. And we had a number of external deadlines with the tribunal, and then we had internal deadlines with the clients. So it was an infrastructure dispute with colossal claims. During the internal call with our team, we discussed our respective work streams, and they were pretty tight deadlines. I mean, there, there was no denial about that, but they were achievable, but obviously they were hectic. What really surprised me was that no one had queried in this meeting how flexible some of these deadlines were. After this call that we have, I received an email from one of the more junior members of our team telling me that he won't be able to get this into me by tomorrow morning because he had a presentation for an arbitration group that he was a part of, which obviously surprised me because if he didn't do the work, that means me and my other colleagues would have to do it, right? But, you know, I was like, fine, if it's just a few hours, we can give him that sort of leeway. I didn't hear from him the entire day. I didn't even hear from him the next day. Uh, when I reached out to him the next day, he said, oh, he was just about to reach out to me and then gave me some sort of um, another deadline that in a few hours he would give me that piece of work. But to be honest, by then I had ended up doing most of that work myself anyway. So the point I was saying earlier about trust, this is basically a scenario where the trust is completely absent here. And you know, if issues come up, after a discussion, I think that's fine. You can probably pick up a phone and call the most senior members of the team to let them know. But if you know you probably won't be able to adhere to that deadline, I think the right time to be discussing this in is during that, that initial meeting or call itself. Deadlines may be arbitrary. These include deadlines with the clients. These include internal deadlines within a team. But the importance of adhering to these deadlines is a way of maintaining that trust, which we shouldn't forget. Before I move on to my next war story, I'll just make one related point here. So when you agree to take on a piece of work, just make sure you end up doing at least most of the work. The worst thing you can do is agree to do it. And at the last minute, days before a submission deadline, for instance, you drop it because you have no capacity, unless it's an obvious and genuine emergency, try not to do this because chances are you probably won't be getting work from that partner or from that senior associate again. We had an intern once who he, he'd have in the same month, I think his uncle, his aunt, his siblings became ill. And we wouldn't even know this until we emailed him to ask where that piece of work was that was supposed to, he was supposed to hand in days ago. So, you know, obviously this was a case where there was no sort of genuinity in his so-called emergency. So building trust with your colleagues is very important. I think in a similar manner, especially in international arbitration, building that same level of trust with opposing counsels or arbitrators is equally important. In international arbitration, we also have as an added element of working as co-counsels in a case because of the differing governing laws and differing procedural seats. So it's important to maintain that level of decorum with them as well. When you have a bit of advantage in a case, it can be quite easy sometimes to forget to treat your counterparties with the same level of courtesy. Don't ever fall into this trap and definitely never use derogatory words against your counterparties. For that matter, against your colleagues as well. In a case I was working on, we had two different firms on each side and there were two lawyers on opposing sides in particular that just did not get along. Every time we had to try and get an agreement on a procedural aspect of a case, it would go back and forth between them. 
to a point where derogatory words were used and it became so hostile to a point of no return. And in that, in the whole proceeding in that case, you know, there were unreasonable challenges. There was barely any agreement between the two sides. And I think everything ended up going to the tribunal. It just did not look good for either of the lawyers. It did not look good for the clients. It wasn't a helpful position to be in. The world of arbitration is a small community. So these things end up sticking on and you wanna avoid building a reputation where you're seen as someone who's hostile or who's an aggressor. But what's equally important is that you never know when it will be your time to ask for an extra bit of leniency to submit a pleading or an expert report. <clears throat> a couple of weeks later than the agreed procedural timetable. In an international arbitration, there's so many stakeholders. You have four or five different expert teams of different disciplines. You have different law firms, external barristers. Sometimes in a case, you have 10 or 20 different fact witnesses. So in a team of 50 or odd people working on a case, someone could have an emergency or an unforeseeable situation of some sort, an illness or a bereavement that you'd probably need that leniency. So try always to maintain that level of courtesy because you, know, you just never know when it would be your time to ask for that level of leniency. So obviously trust and integrity are all the same sort of virtues and principles that one should always remember. And don't put yourself in a situation where you compromise that. If you're going to be late on a deadline, own up to it early. Let the person know, pick up the phone. If something can't be done though, I would say before letting the person know, try to find ways to get it done. Uh, if you can't find a certain document for disclosure, you can't hand in a piece of research. In the first instance, always try harder. I had an associate who would always tell me without fail that something couldn't be done because he was having IT issues. And you know, that may have been true, of course, but what really irked me was that he just never proactively came up with a solution instead of just emailing me to tell me he couldn't do it. And nine times out of 10, when I looked into the same issue, I'd find a solution that could be resolved almost immediately. And it would involve maybe using a different platform or getting it done through other ways, but there are always solutions. So be someone that we call a solution savvy. Don't be someone who always says no. So the two points I wanted to make for students before I have one other concluding point would be, it's important for students not to shut themselves from different practice areas. Try doing or, or playing your hand in the commercial or even the banking department when you're doing an internship. Even if you know international arbitration is what you want to do, the principles that guide international arbitrations don't exist in a vacuum. So having that exposure in domestic litigation or even in the corporate department are beneficial. For instance, you get, you'll always get a sense of what clients' considerations are in choosing a dispute resolution forum only in the corporate departments. <clears throat> in a similar manner, don't shut yourself off from different routes in the legal profession, whether it's academia or the barrister's route. I think Suresh also touched on looking into tribunal secretaries and arbitral institutions as great alternatives to getting exposure and hearings. So I started off my presentation on trust and I'll end off with the three Ps, which I think are extremely valuable for any young practitioner. Persistence, perseverance, and patience. As a first year lawyer in Singapore, we were assigned a case before a military prosecution court. And it was an uphill hurdle to begin with because the threshold of proving a valid defense in these cases are very, very high. We had a trainee in this case who had done such extensive research. He compiled this huge file comprising authorities from different jurisprudence. And most of the things he came up with, we couldn't use anyway uh, because they were not valid or because he had looked at different or wrong jurisprudence. But what stuck on till this very day was his sheer dedication. He persisted, he persevered, and he was so patient. And the fact that this story is on my mind almost 10 years down the road is just a testament of how important these three Ps are. And with that, I'm going to end my presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Krishbu. That's a very good point. I, I think it's very easy to forget to be faithful to the basics. I mean, to meet deadlines, to build trust with colleagues in the team, or to maintain the minimum level of courtesy when working when uh, with many stakeholders in the field. Um, we have a live question from the audience uh, in that line. Um, what are some best ways to seek leniency under a rigorous intensive environment wisely instead of just saying essentially this can't be done? That's a great uh, question actually, but 
I think I alluded to in my presentation is about coming up with a solutions-based approach. So if you know this is an unachievable deadline, you definitely won't be able to do it. What you can do is to the extent that you're able to meet that deadline, be upfront about that. And you can tell that person, um, well, you can do so-and-so task until this point, And then after that, you probably have no capacity or what you can proactively do is find somebody who has capacity and would be willing to share that workload with you. So these are just some ways. And most, in nine times out of 10, in my experience, if you come up with a solution-based approach, it shows your genuinity in trying to do the work, which is always going to be a positive. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, one more question for you, Kushbu. Uh, this is uh, coming from a different line, but um, I mean, I guess many of young practitioners or students will be curious to hear your thoughts on um, this. I, I, I'm still struggling to find out the answer too, but how did you or how do you manage the work-life balance uh, working in a firm as a senior associate? That's an excellent question. And it's not easy, but I think what we have to do is the whole definition or the whole connotation of work-life balance as a practicing lawyer is a bit different. So you may not get every Tuesdays off to go for yoga. You may not get every Thursdays off to catch up with friends, but you're always inevitably going to have downtime. So when a big submission comes in and you have six months to prepare, the first two months, you're usually just reading into the case. Those are generally downtimes where you have no urgent deadlines per se. You're just you know, sitting in your room, just trying to get, get just absorb all the information that's in these pleadings. To me, these are kind of downtimes where you can take advantage of going out to meet a friend or going for your gym classes a bit more. And then there'll be certain months or cycles where it gets a bit hectic. You have a little bit more deadlines, you have urgent timelines to adhere to. Those would be where you probably have to sacrifice your personal life a little bit or your social life a little bit. Thank you very much, Kushbu. Um, Let's move on to our next speaker. Last but not least, um, we will hear from Mr. Ujay Kim again. Um, Ujay is a partner at International Arbitration Team at BKL in Seoul. Um, he will share some short tips for practicing arbitration in a Korean law firm. Um, thank you so much, Ujay, for making yourself available for the second session. Um, the floor is yours. Thank you, um, Sami. And, uh... Um, it's an honor to be uh, filling in, and um, and uh, just uh, because uh, because uh, so many of the tips for um, students and for young practitioners uh, ha have been covered by 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 the three speakers in the second um, session. Um, I'm, I'm not entirely confident that I have much to add uh, to to the points that have already been made. Um, but that said, um, being a Korean lawyer. And uh, having worked in a Korean law firm, two Korean law firms actually, um, for the last uh, 10, 10 plus years, um, I, I do have uh, a couple of tips that I, I do want to share, like with some of the younger practitioners and, and the students uh, uh, in this webinar. So, but that being said, before I sort of jump onto these issues, I just want to add the caveat that these are issues and points that I'm still struggling with and I'm still working on. So, I add that big caveat and add my um, two cents uh, to this very important issue. Um, so I, I think um, there can be various views, but there are some aspects that, that come with practicing um, international arbitration in a, a Korean law firm. Um, and I say this because not just not because um, it, it, it concerns Korean law, but it, it has a lot to do with the language because of course, um, you can you can speak uh, English fluently, which I'm not um, which I'm not able to do. Like you know, but uh, but you can speak English fluently, and that might sort of relieve some of your burden. But th there are limitations uh, that come with uh, the, the language barrier. So I get that question a lot. Um, so so what, what is the, how do you overcome that? Um, how, how do you sort of uh, distinguish yourself or or prove your value as a Korean lawyer who has who has that kind of a limitation, but at the same time, who's working in the field of international arbitration. Now, be, before I, I sort of answer those, those questions, I think um, you need to sort of take a step back and, and, and sort of ask yourself, why, why are you interested in international arbitration? I think from a personal perspective, um, I became interested in international arbitration because it gives you somewhat of a pathway or an opportunity to meet practitioners from other backgrounds. 
and uh, test yourself. And uh, it, it's a challenge, but, but at the same time, it's a very interesting challenge. And, and, and for you to be able to sort of persuade someone from a different background, from a different law, based on a different law is a very intriguing experience. And I think that that's one of the main reasons why I became um, interested in international arbitration. I, and I assume that's one of the reasons why a lot of the people here in this webinar and a lot of younger practitioners or students are um, interested in international arbitrations as a Korean lawyer. Now, having said that, so, so, so what do you need to work on um, to be effective? Um, arguably, uh, if you do arbitration in the Korean law firm, uh, there are slight difference in roles that a Korean lawyer like myself plays and maybe a foreign lawyer plays in carrying out a case. Um, the burden of, uh, of, I guess, more drafting uh, could be laid down to a foreign lawyer, like you know, whereas the Korean lawyer does more of the legal analytics to the extent that the governing law is Korean law or, or fact or, or, or sort of gathering, collating the relevant fact to the case that may be sort of uh, be a burden of the Korean lawyer. But you see more cases where, and I think this is the more prevalent practice here in Korea, that, that there's not that big divide anymore, in, even in Korean law firms. So I think in, in, that kind of, in, in those kind of circumstances, it just boils down to um, the word that was, I think, repeated in, in the previous sessions, the basics. Um, if you're a Korean lawyer, I think you really need to be focused, and if you're a student, uh, if you're a Korean lawyer, like, you know, you, you, of course, you, your interest could be on international arbitration, the many principles and in investment treaty arbitrations, those, those are very, all very intriguing topics. But for, for when you're starting, I think it's important to be more focused on the basic stuff as in civil law, like, you know, I mean, civil law and, and contract law, because, and you may ask, like, you know, I mean, how does that relate to, um, to international arbitration? But if you actually deal with cases as a Korean lawyer, regardless of the governing law, it just boils down, in many cases, just boils down to pure contract interpretation and very basic contract principles. So in that regard, I think in terms of starting out your practice, you really need to hone yourself in, 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 in developing yourself in, in, into those basic law and principles that, that you'll be sort of tested on. And, and that's, I think, the first tip that I would give, especially to Korean lawyers practicing arbitration in Korean law firms. And the second point that I, I, I would like to make is um, just really focusing on your basic legal writing. And uh, I say this um, with, with uh, uh, and I say this uh, without confidence because I know that there are very, there are better writers out there. Than, I mean, and I'm always uh, developing my writing, but, uh, but to me, it always comes across as writing. Of course, there are differences when you're writing in English and when you're writing in Korean or you're writing in some other language, but the basics are, are, are the same. Um, you come to a conclusion, you give reasons and you persuade. And you, you really have to hone that, you have to put that structure in your head and, and, and test yourself and see how that sort of plays out in the draft, whether you write in Korean and whether you write in English. And to the extent that you have that structure, um, like, you know, uh, working for you, like, you know, as you work on any case, um, I, I'm, I'm quite confident that it will help you sort of um, navigate through the difficult issues and the different issues that you'll be asked to sort of um, tackle on. So um, sort of getting that basic structure of writing, I think is the second point that young uh, students and young practitioners um, need to focus on. And um, just uh, my third point is, um, is uh, just just uh, aside from the the more the boring uh, topics that I just discussed about the, the basic law and uh, basic legal writing, like you know, um, I, I think it's important, like you know, uh, to really show yourself in terms of uh, not just in terms of networking, but I've I've come I, I've come to learn that in persuading someone, it's good to be aggressive in a good way, as in. Um, you, you don't hold back. You could be wrong, but I think in, in, in a lot of, including Korea in, in, in Asian countries where you're taught to not, like to give the right answers and you're scolded in many, in many times, like when you give the wrong answers, uh, we, we, we have an inherent fear of giving 
the wrong answer. And, and of course, uh, you shouldn't be giving too many wrong answers, for that's always a fact uh, to, your, to, your, to, your, to your partners. But, but at the same time, if you hold back and, and, and if you don't provide your thoughts to your colleagues and, and of course, the tribunal to the other side, the co-counsel, um, you, you will lose the chance of establishing your presence and, 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 and ultimately, I think, um, not get to experience the pure joy of international arbitration where you really dive into the issues and take control uh, of a case with people from different backgrounds. And, and that's the really intriguing part of international arbitration. So I, I think uh, the third point, just not holding back, being brave is, is one of the points that, that, that needs to be uh, really considered. So um, those are my, my, my two cents about, about what, what to sort of focus on as a student or as a practitioner a practicing arbitration in a Korean law firm. But, uh, but uh, as I said, um, those three points I'm still working on, but I hope uh, there are others who are working on those three points with me. So um, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you so much for the yeah. practical tips, Sujay. I, I couldn't agree more as another Korean lawyer here. Um, I, I have one um, question for you. So you've done an LLM in the States, um, yeah. and I'm sure many students will be, and other young practitioners would be interested to hear your thoughts on um, starting the LLM in the middle of your career. Mm -hmm. um, do you think it's necessary to have a dual law degree, or what, what's your thoughts on this? Um, I, I, um, I think there can be uh, various views on this, but uh, just in terms of speaking as a person who practices international, and I know, Sammy, that you've done your LLM, but, uh, but, uh, but, it's, it's, I, but I think I, the short answer is I think, yes, an LLM degree helps. Um, uh, of course, the time off, like you're doing your LLM as a Korean lawyer, it helps a lot. Uh, but at the same time, when, when you work, of course, you deal with cases, but you, you often, I, I think from, from personal experience, um, you, you wonder like, you know, what the, the, the principles are or the basics of like, you know, of a different like, you know, legal jurisdiction as in being a civil lawyer. I think I've, I've always had the, had, the, had the urge to know more about like, you know, the, the basic principles about contract interpretation in, in common law. Like, you know, people tell you like, you know, oh, like, you know, it's, it's similar, like, you know, but at the same time, like, you know, um, you want to know more. So, I think my time in the States uh, uh, and doing an LLM helped me sort of know more about those things, those basics. And, um, and, and at the same time, um, meeting new people from different backgrounds who have similar interests, that was also uh, a, a, an eye-opening experience for me. So yes, um, doing an LLM was very helpful for me. And, and, and I recommend it to a lot of the Korean attorneys. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing your story, Uje. Um, we've got another live question from the mm -hmm. audience for you. Okay. Um, do you have any practical tips on improving legal writing? Okay. Well, I, I think I've said it three times, uh, but that's something that I'm still working on right now. But, uh, but, uh, but, but um, I don't know. Um, like you know, um, there, there are I think better people to answer that question. But it's, I, to me, it's all about structure and having the ability to say the same thing in five different ways and, and how you can do that in terms of structure uh, and knowing the different terms. I think it's useful to really, if you have, if you're working at a law firm and if you have time, like, you know, um, really like, you know, dig into, or, or like, you know, um, like really read closely, like, you know, what others have written, like, you know, of course, reading The Economist, like, you know, other reference, The New Yorker, they're all good materials, like, you know, but, like, you know, reading a brief in, in, a, in a large case that, that, of course, like you may not have been a part of, like, you know, but what reading what others have written is, is the best reference, like, you know, in, in improving your writing, like, you know, and, and if you sort of, if you can get that, like, you know, into your system, as in, like, if you can sort of write in that way, how other practitioners at a very high level write, I think that becomes an asset and that eventually uh, makes you a better writer. Thank you, Uje. Um, I guess your presentation is really um, is touching the students' um, hearts. So okay. we've got another live question from the students. Um, 
So if you're a Korean law school student applying to a Korean law firm, would it be risky to show interest only in international arbitration? Would it be better to show interest in more diverse fields of law in your personal statement interviews? Um, I know you're not a recruiting uh, person in, in uh, here. You're not here as a reporting, uh, recruiting person capacity, but um, can you share your thoughts on this? Um, I, I, um, um, <laughs> that's a tough question like you know and uh and uh um but i think it's helpful if you of course like you, you'll have your interest in international arbitration but at the same time i think um um if firm like you know any 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 big law firm like lee and co or, or big bkl like you know um they they also focus they want they are looking also for versatility like you know and, and so saying that your interest in international arbitration is good like you know but but at the same time like you know if you have the capacity um like you know telling the firm like you know that you can do other stuff and you're interested in other fields is also very helpful so so um don't 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 shy away um like you know let them know what you can do like what you're interested in and and, and people will take you seriously it's not as if um um, they, they only like, you know, give you two minutes, like, you know, for, for each, uh, um, for, for, for what you submit, like, you know, it's a close read every time. So don't be shy and be brave. Thank you so much for taking questions, Ujay. Um, I would like to lead our session to the end. Um, and thank you again, our panelists for your time and sharing great advices and stories with us. Also a big thank you to our audience uh, for tuning in and submitting live questions. Um, if you have any other questions or would like to seek advice from any of our panelists, including myself, um, please don't hesitate to contact us. I'm sure um, everyone will be happy to address your questions. Um, thank you and back to you, Sangjin. Thank you, Ms. Sammy Kim and speakers for the second session. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you found today's presentations informative and useful. Please join me in extending a special thanks to Lee Kyung and Tang Ye, the entire team that made YAD possible. And we would like to thank Professor Joongi Kim who supported us throughout the journey. Most importantly, we sincerely thank every one of you for spending time with us today. Please join us again next year for YAD 2022. Thank you and see you next year.